a soldier, an airman, and a marine walk into a room. This show is The Punchline. My name is Ryan Smeltz, and you're watching Veteran Talk Show. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't make it yesterday, I mean, because we were playing you're on... good. It's actually a benefit, because now that you're here, like, we have yesterday's session, today's session, like, I'm all about the amount of content. Yeah. So each of these sessions is going to be broken up into multiple episodes. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you get it. I get it. I'm there. I'm tracking, as they say. Tra tracking like a tank. All right. Welcome back once again to another recording session. Uh, this is a veteran talk show. So I know last time I told you, Joe, that we have a website. I put resources on there. I got a buddy that does like, uh, calls himself the comeback coach. Yeah. Um, so I got him on there. He wrote a book yesterday. We did a, a recording session with Casey uh -huh. Air Force. Um, he actually works with people with disabilities no, nice. and with veterans. So he sent me a ton of resources too. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, you don't have to go in a lot of detail, but, um, before we, uh, hit record here, you were talking a little bit about how 2021 is treating you. Yeah, it's uh, not looking much better than 2020. <laughs> Personally wise, I mean, kind of maybe plateaued there a little it, bit. Yeah, it's not. It's the it's the remnants of fucking 2020. I think. I think Just, uh, had a lot of lot of family, a lot of family issues, and you know, it's been it's just been weird. It's I been you, bad. Man. Um. So what that made me think of is like, uh, I talked before about stuff like this to. Uh, to some people who were like, they they didn't say that veterans are like always negative or anything like that, but they said we have an interesting approach to it. Yeah. And I said, I feel like that's because when you're in the shit, when you're in the desert, when you're in the rain and the mud, whatever, it's like a hot shower is a positive. Oh, yeah. Whereas for most people, that's just like normal everyday stuff. For us, it's like, I'd kill for a cold beer right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd and kill. so it's like making It's the little jokes. things. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. the little things that make you, like, I remember, you know, getting hot meals in Afghanistan, um, you know, more than, so we had those little, like, those big, they were like MREs, right? They were the big box ones, though. Yeah. Like, you had to pull a tap, and it, like, the water heated up the food, and you, that's what you would eat, or you'd eat an MRE. And then there was like, we were there for like Thanksgiving. And so like they shipped down like a bunch of steaks and shit to us. I, I, and like, I have pictures of this <laughs> and we took like Hesco barrier wire and put it over a fire and that became our grill. And so we Done. just, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> the worst day you'll ever eat. Yeah. Like, but when you're over there, it's like, this is the greatest thing ever. You're like, fuck yeah. I've never had a better meal. Yeah. This <laughs> is like, I know what death row inmates feel like on their last meal. <laughs> I mean, it's so true, though, because a lot of times, like, you know, when I was in, people would hear me say something, you know, maybe kind of sarcastic about, like, well, you know, it, it's raining, but at least it's not raining that hard. Yeah. And so that's, like, just a joke, and it, it makes everybody laugh, and it's like, we have to be here. Yeah. No matter what. There's nowhere to go. You just got to yeah. deal with it. Yeah, and then, you know, you hit the civilian world, and a lot of people want to focus on the positive things. And they hear me say something like that, and they're like, "What's wrong with you?" Yeah, I've seen that like, I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm, you know, just like, dude, you're so depressed. And I'm like, I'm really not depressed. Yeah, this is just how I look at life now. Like, thanks, <laughs> thanks, was it? Thanks, Bin Laden. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, you just you find like. You just uh, you have to deal with so much shitty situations, whether it's overseas or it just training. I mean, we used to have the phrase. So when I dropped to the fleet, we were working up to go to Iraq, and I feel like every week from the time I dropped to the fleet to the time we went to Iraq, I was in the field every week training, yeah. and it was like every week was raining at Camp Lejeune. And, and, and you so, were you were infantry, too. yeah. And so there was no like living in houses and stuff. Like I remember at Fort. Picket, we went up to Fort Pickett. We were started sleeping outside. Then it started snowing on us, and they were like, "Well, maybe we should get these guys some tents." And they were like shitty tents. Like they were like, 
five dollar tents that they found on craigslist or something nice. and we were like yeah <laughs> like, this is fucking nice we like got we got tents we don't have to sleep in the snow this is great like this is the best thing that's going to happen to me this week everything else is going to just be shitty so you just you you have those those moments and so we had this we had the phrase like it it, it, it you ain't tra- uh it, if it ain't raining, you ain't training. Mm-hmm. That was kind of the thing. Like there were all these memes going around at the time of like, <laughs> there was a picture. I, I'll, the funniest one I ever saw was a picture of like a dude. Uh, he took a picture from like an airplane and he's looking down and he can see like the rain clouds over like pine forest and the cat. And it was just in this one little spot. And the catch was like right there, our Marines training. And you're just like, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, <laughs> that's what it's like. You like find the rain. That's you, like, you find the one patch of rain that you're just going to be like, fuck it. So if it, if it wasn't raining on us in training, it was just muggy and miserable. Like yeah. you just could not escape just the heat. And it was, it, yeah, you just, everything just sucked. And you yeah. just kind of dealt with, with it. Like and you, you, just, you embrace it. That's you embrace what it. We used to say embrace yeah. the suck. Yeah. You just embrace it. You, yeah. I, I, we never said embrace the suck. We're just kind of like, well, it's, you know, tough shit. It's life. Like deal with it. <laughs> Ain't no use in complaining like about a it. Frank Sinatra song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's you just you just have to like and you like we would complain about it. Like it oh, was yeah. like it was not a thing where it's like oh we're just not going to be like put smiles on our face. No, we would. You know we used to, you know a, a bitching marine is a happy marine. That's what we used to say. Like every enlisted and senior in, uh, senior enlisted guy was always like if the marines aren't bitching something's wrong. Yeah. That's and that's that's how they looked at it. They're like, if we don't hear something, it's either because they are they are killing small animals somewhere, or they're doing something they shouldn't be, and that's not a good thing. Or a combination of both. Or, or a combination of both. Like we, because there's so much standby to stand by. Oh yeah. Right. I can't tell you how many times they were like, we have to be at the armory to check out our weapons at zero three zero four. Motor T is going to come pick us up, and we're going to go out to the field. And so, of course, all of us would be down there, at, you know, with our weapons in hand in the parking lot waiting for Motor T to show up at like 03 in the morning, ready to go. And trucks wouldn't show up until like eight or nine o'clock. You're like, why the fuck did I have to get out of bed this early? Like, what? And it's already, and it's raining. So you're just kind of like, man, this, this is just how this week is going to go. Yeah. Like, so you just, yeah, you stand by to stand by. That was, that was always the, the popular one for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'll never forget on a workup for Iraq, we are waiting again for Motor T. Mm-hmm. And we are standing, always, right? uh, always, always waiting for Motor T. <laughs> wait, and we had, we had been out in the field all week. And um, so we're just kind of hanging out. I think we were at Combat Town in at Camp Lejeune, which is like this old bombed out bu- like bunch of buildings. Yeah. Like they designed it to make it look like it's like rubble. Mm-hmm. Like think of videos from like World War II of like all bombed out houses and shit. Mm-hmm. And so we had done all of our training and everything, and uh, we're just kind of waiting. And there's this big industrial fan just outside, and it's it, there's a pl- it's plugged in and it works. And so we're all just kind of standing around because it's hot as shit. And so we're just standing around this thing trying to get like air blown on us. <laughs> and there's probably like ten of us standing around this giant fucking thing. And one I can't remember who says like someone's like dude, we should find a lizard and drop it into this thing. And everyone's like, yes, like, this is what we're going to do. And then this is our new, this is our new goal in life. So we all start like making jokes about, we didn't actually find anything, but we all start making jokes about it. And then my Corman comes walking out of nowhere and he's got his med bag on him. He's like, Hey guys, what's going on? I'm like, Hey doc, what's up? And we just keep, you know, shooting the shit. And finally someone looks at him and was like, doc, why the fuck do you have your med bag? It's like the first thing I learned in core school. First thing they taught us. If you ever see a group of Marines standing around with nothing to do, get your med back because someone is either either someone is about to die or get seriously injured. There's nothing good comes from bored Marines. And we all thought about it. We're like, man, no, no, checks out. It yeah. checks out. Like it actually makes sense. Yeah. Like you we would make stupid little games that just sound so dumb. Like we would put Kevlars down. Like our Kevlars, yeah. like five feet away from us while we're sitting somewhere and just waiting for something to happen. We're just picking up rocks and just tossing them into the Kevlars. That's so, still, 
like and uh, entertain a high quality yeah. game yeah that's entertainment for like three hours <laughs> like the civilian world they're like that sounds so fucking boring and you're like yeah it's fun we're going for the high school yeah we're going for that <laughs> i want i want to fill that thing to the brim <laughs> that's you know hashtag goals right there yeah <laughs> yeah you find these you find yeah and you play like you you play these stupid pranks you play like just anything that can take your mind off of yeah. of just the stupid shit that you we're have to deal with yeah we're waiting yeah and just training yeah when you're training it's fine like when you're actually moving and doing stuff um but while you're sitting around and just kind of fucking wait like i'll never forget the machine gunners in our company had this game um so Typically, how infantry platoons work is you, or infantry line companies work, is you have three platoons of, of uh, infantry and then a fourth platoon of like weapons guys. So, like your mortarmen and your machine gunners and all that shit. Okay. However, for us, what they did was they broke that platoon up and went ahead because those guys would usually get assigned throughout the different platoons. So, what yep. they did was they just said, We're just going to have four line platoons and go ahead and break off all the weapons guys into their individual platoons and those they will be part of that platoon yeah so it's probably better for team cohesion. yeah it is it bit. really because you, you you have to work with them so but so they had this game and i don't know who came up with this game um i don't know if it was passed down or what but they had the machine gunners had this thing this little prank that they would play on each other they someone went and got the the biggest dildo you can imagine i mean girth of a soup can and it like size of a forearm and it's veiny and it's got it's got everything like it is just massive just to recap really quick this is a game this is a game this yeah. is a game so the game the game the well it was a prank so the prank was okay they would place it into somebody's a gun a gun bag like the barrel bag right and not tell them and see how long it took them to find and we all had this type of game like so they would stick this thing and when you found it you'd be like shit i've got the cock now and like you would have to go and find another machine gunner and put it into and his shit in his. okay so we were at 29 palms on the work i think this was for the workup for iraq and something happened and i can't remember what the like event that happened but there were two companies for our two battalions at 29 palms mm. i think we were rotating out of 29 palms and the next unit was coming in we were at camp wilson yep. and something got stolen from the other company and i can't remember what it was but it was something big enough that they the end both companies had to do a job a, j a junk on the bunk so we had to pull our cots outside of these metal of, of the metal huts that are camp wilson and stay and put dump all of our shit onto the cots and like the officers and, and staff ncos all had to walk through and check everything make sure you didn't have what did you have and for some odd reason can, you can already see where this, this is going. oh yeah you can see where the, well here's the thing if it was like a if it was like a like a gunnery sergeant or even like a sergeant major they'd just be like don't do that that's fucking stupid dude come on like they would they probably yell at you a little bit but nothing like nothing you couldn't handle but for some odd reason there was this high ranking like i think he was like a full bird or a general or something walking around just like overseeing all of this and he walks past and i'm like seven or eight people away from where this is happening and i can see the look on the guys i can he i literally hear him he dumps his a bag out and he goes fuck and i look <laughs> up and he says it pretty loudly and everyone looks over and we don't know why he said that so so is this where because because i've done similar things before you know we call it just called them layouts yeah we just kind of upset we didn't know yeah. about job because yeah, that's awesome that's but but we we I tell that to civilians are like a job you had to do a job you had to do a job you know job <laughs> spells you job you have right? to spell it you can just say it fucking crayon eaters <laughs> yeah but we would do it and then uh, of course people would come by so usually if it was sensitive items you know not necessarily something lost it would already be laid out by the time the the officer got there so this was a scenario where they're they're there watching us do with this watching you dump like it we're out. dumping everything out so they're kind of walking like, around we don't want you to dump it out beforehand because we want to see if you've got it i don't know hide it. i don't know what the theory was i mean we got we had come out of the field probably like the the day prior and this was one of those things like word got passed that hey we're doing this like fucking now 
stand there, get your bags ready. Like, yeah, go grab your cot, go. go grab your cots out of the out of the fucking metal huts. Bring them outside. Get all your shit that you brought with you to the Twenty Nine Palms and dump all that shit on the cot. And we're just kind of like, okay, like I was like, whatever, like. Lance Corporal, don't, yeah, like yep. Lance Corporal, don't know. Like, I'm just gonna <laughs> fucking dump shit down because that's what you're telling me to do. I'm not gonna ask questions. So, this like, I can't remember. He was an older. He was like in his like like mid fifties. So I got like, and he had silver. Like it's one of those things. Like you see the silver walking on the collar, and you're like, so the was, glint of the sun. Yeah. You're like, I don't even want to see what that is. <laughs> he was he was in for like forty. Years. Yeah, he he was, and he walks Golly. he walks by. And he stops, and you just hear this, the fuck is that? <laughs> and the dude who had this thing pops up and turns around and stands at attention. He's like, oh, shit. And he just picks this thing up off the cot, off the cot, and is, like, holding this big, giant, floppy dildo. And, I mean, it was huge. It was nothing, it, it, like, it, it, I don't imagine it could what ever be used. This? this was like, oh, this had to be, this is the beginning of 08. I'm just saying, like, in this today's like, day and age, I can see a bunch of people, like... like yeah, oh, yeah. No, this was... Yeah, this was 08. And he just is like... he, And he's like, this is why this battalion's such a piece of shit. Blah, blah. And he's waving this thing around. <laughs> this and, is why. Yeah, like, you pieces of shit. And blah, blah. And he's yelling. So, like, we're all standing at attention and everything because he's now yelling. So we're like, oh, I guess this is what we have to do. And I... So the guy's, like, six or seven people over and, like, two two rows up or something like that. So I can see in my peripheral vision what's happening. And I swear to God, he is waving this thing at this Marine, this guy's head. And I know this, <laughs> and this dude's funny as shit. I love this guy, but he is just getting smacked with it. And like his, I, I swear to God, at one point, his eight point cover came flying off because he got hit with it. And to see this, like this was like full bird colonel or general yelling, waving this floppy giant dildo <laughs> at everybody is, was one of the, funniest sights i've ever seen in my entire like we were all sitting there trying just so hard not to laugh and i think back and i'm like this guy had to know that it was a prank and he's just like trying to get us to just laugh he can't be really that mad yeah. about it like no one is that dumb like <laughs> no one is thinking like this is like he's using that like this is a prank yeah it came out of his his barrel bag. yeah like he like, came out of his barrel he had no idea it was even there until yeah. he dumped his barrel bag and he's like he was just like fuck so you can see, see this guy saying something like the guy whose bag it was in you can see him saying something like uh is that what y'all were looking for is that <laughs> i is could that see what was missing I, like <laughs> like if it was anyone else yelling at him like if it was like our company commander or something i could see him saying something like that or like especially like my platoon commander well, if it was my platoon commander was like sees this shit and is like, what the fuck is it? They all knew about the, this prank that was going on. Like, they all knew. Like, they were in on the joke. So, I could see them finding this thing and being like, uh, oh, yeah, this isn't what we're looking for, but good one. Ha <laughs> ha, good one. I see what you did. But this, this older officer who was, he was just... He, he, he like was all but invented the Marine Corps. He, yeah, he like he's been, you know, he's been in longer than old Chesty. Like he's, <laughs> he was just not having it. He was fucking pissed, and he's waving this thing, and he's yelling, and he's screaming, he's calling us all shit bags and whatever. And we're at attention, so we can't say anything. Like we can't do anything. We're just like, and we're just trying not to laugh we are just i am it's taking every ounce and like you start to hear people break like because <laughs> like, this is just fucking hilarious and he throws the thing in the dirt and he like he's just storms off and he's like it was the fun like we all once he like got out of sight we just started laughing like there was just a collective like <laughs> that was great that was the funniest shit ever somebody in the background sir where are you going <laughs> come back come back sir yeah that was Our, ours was uh I mean, we had jokes like that, but no, I'll, I'll tell you the comparable one to what you just talked about, because mind you, you were infantry, I was an MP. Yeah. So where you guys wait on Motor T, somebody to come transport you, we just get in the trucks and go. Um, so, like, Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, 
If you've drawn weapons in the military, you know what drawing a Humvee is like. You got to get the paperwork, PMCS it, take it back up, get it approved. You have to redispatch it at least once a week. It's a pain in the ass. But anyway, I just showed up to a window and said, "I need this Humvee," and they're yeah. like, "Here you go. Take this one. Go, go grab that one. It's right there." All right, cool. It's for official use. And yeah, and when you're a boot, they're like, "Oh, I also need the keys." <laughs> Which is, um, which is another great little hazing, hazing story. <laughs> Go grab the keys of the Humvee. Okay. Well, I mean, for for us at least, that was an actual thing. Only it was a cord that wrapped uh, around a steering wheel and a padlock. Oh no, we had. A, so the funny thing about that is, it might be a sixty-eight point turn, but you could still steal a Humvee. Without the keys. Plus the uh, the eleven fifty ones have the combat lock. The big the, on the metal doors. So you would lock. All three of the other doors from the inside by pushing down, and then the exterior door had a lock. So you actually had to have keys for the Humvees that we had, but they weren't to start it. <laughs> I never saw a key for a Humvee in my life. But these are up armored, so like yeah, we not- had the up armored ones, but they had the like the little the thing that you like push down, like the p- metal pole that pushed into another like a hole. That was like our our combat locks. I don't know if it locked it from the end. All I, I know, know that's how it acted, but it was a door handle that you would push down. Yeah, it was like this. Well, yeah, but it was attached to this like metal pole that like bolted it into into place. So if something happened, the doors wouldn't go flying the fuck off. Because <laughs> nothing's worse than getting blown up and then losing, not having losing a fucking door, any cover anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, but when we were on patrol, like because MPs, at least when I was in, had five major functions. One of those was law enforcement, so we got to play police officer. And so, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, well. uh, the comparable <laughs> thing that that we did, I, now, it is not half as fun as what you just talked about, was chem light tag. So it's the exact same concept, but now that you tell me about that, it would have been much better with a giant dildo. Oh, yeah. It's, it's except, way better with a giant dildo. integrated, so there's girls and guys. Yeah, we didn't have that problem. Somebody would have got plus, just... Plus there's just, the ACPs, which yeah. are civilian nope. police officers. Nothing nothing like that. Just a bunch of dudes. At, but, uh, well, a, at the time. Now they're like, light yeah. and I find your car, or maybe you and I are talking. Like, you see cop, cops park mm-hmm. like this all the time. Whatever it is. And then when I'm ready, I just kind of sneak it into drive so you don't notice me shift gears, put on the brake, <sighs> chuck that fucker in your car, and take off. And then... You have to do it somebody, but you see yeah, how it's, it's kind of it's, degraded. It's like the same game. Oh, oh yeah, but you're using fun. yeah, you're you're like, using chem lights. That's like oh, that's like light? yeah. Oh wow, oh, oh risky, super offensive yeah. there. <laughs> way to way to make that game G rated. I think. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the number one thing is if you tried to park to run radar and didn't notice you had it like in the back window. Then people would be slowing down before they got to you, like, oh, there's the cops. And you're like, why is everybody slowing down? Because they can see you. Because they can see you, But that's, dumbass. that's luck of the draw. Otherwise, it ends up on the floorboard. And once again. Yeah, we did. I mean, you just do and so how much. much how long did chem light last? Like 12 hours? I don't know. I, I, I've, got, I've got a story about a chem light that's. that's not G rated? That's not G rated. I, I got to. Uh, okay, so I'm going to tell one of mine <laughs> first because you're probably going to one-up me so i'd, I'd rather follow and i'm not a one-upper I, I no i know I'm not, i'd rather I'm not a... follow it up with a good story so so mine is just the ir chem lights mm-hmm. so we go out on a training event me and this other kid are we're like brand new pfcs we're literally just training we haven't even been notified of deployment yet so we're fresh out of advanced training you know first duty station we're down at fort polk we go out on a training exercise and the platoon sergeant is like, hey, go grab the chem lights and, like, pop open five of them or whatever. So he's over there. Or, no, 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 I think he said just one, just one or two. So he's over there, and he's taking a box out of the case, and he opens it, and he tears the plastic off, and he cracks it, and he shakes it, and then he keeps doing it. And, and the, the platoon sergeant comes over and is like, hey, man, what are you doing? Like, I told you to get one. It doesn't take that long. He's like, no, these fucking work. They're fucking broke. <laughs> They're IR, idiot. He's he's like, let me see that real quick. And that's what happened is we were supposed to take regular ones. 
Oh, I don't think we were supposed to have the our, but, but once we found that out, then they, they so this PFC is over there getting angry because all the chem, get like, the batteries I, for the chem lights. I didn't think these expired. Why the fuck aren't they working? Just throw, he's literally just throwing them on the ground when he shakes it and it doesn't light up. We, yeah, so <laughs> this is that this really does sound like a one up thing story. So we were again 29 palms i don't know why so so many of my stories involve 29 palms 29 palms is where the hollywood marines are isn't that no so so 29 palms is where that's your your deployment training yeah so you go yeah you go out there for pre-deployment training it used to be cacs which meant like combined arms training um then they changed it to mojave viper i don't know what the fuck they're calling it these days but it's where you go and like you actually do large. So most of your training in in the Marine Corps, when you're doing live fire stuff, is usually done at most the platoon level. Yeah. You very rarely do something that's at a company level or bigger, and you don't usually do stuff with indirect fire assets on the same range. At twenty nine Palms, that's where all of that. Well, I don't know how they're doing it these days, but back then, that's where you would go and like so, like your mortar men would break out mortars and like they'd shoot live mortar rounds as you're maneuvering around the range. Oh. You know, you'd have tanks like come out and do shit with you. You'd have like cobras fly overhead and fucking do shit way yeah. off in the you know. So it's where you're combi- doing a lot it's of combined like, arms. It's uh, like JRTC down at Fort Polk and NTC <laughs> out at Fort Irwin, but that's for the army. Yeah, so that's but that's where we would go. And you got, and typically it was like a four straight, four straight weeks of training, three to four weeks. And when you landed at 20, like you spent maybe one or two days at Camp Wilson and the rest of the time you were just out in the desert going from range to range. And you'd start like with platoon size ranges and then you'd move up to like company size ranges and then you'd do like, you know, a live fire range. So we did like live fire ranges on like a combat town, yeah. also, you know, tank supported and shit like that. Like that's where you kind of get more 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 than just you know shooting at ivan targets like you're actually allowed to like throw hand grenades into bunkers and clear bunkers out and do all of that kind of crazy shit that like you see in the movies yeah um so we were out at 20 this was for the workup for afghanistan and he was he was one of my best friends at the time he was in another platoon and it was nighttime we had just moved to this other space and it you know we were kind of the day it ended and everything, we were bivouacked out and the sun had gone down. We're all just kind of hanging out, like just moving between the platoon, smoking and joking. Just, you know, it's like seven or eight o'clock at night, you know, so you're not sleeping yet. A random ass debate or game of spades. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So just random shit's going off. And I'm, I'm with my platoon and all of a sudden, like, so when you bivouac, you bivouac in formation. Yeah. Right. So you have first platoon, second platoon, third platoon, fourth platoon, and then all the you know officers and just and NCOs are sleeping kind of at the head of those platoons, and then the company commander and first sergeant and company um, elements are all sleeping in front of all of that. Right. So if you like took an aerial photo, it would look like a formation, yeah. like marching formation. So I look up and I see this like. F- this green thing this just kind of not gonna end well. yeah it's it's not <laughs> i see this green thing like flapping in the wind and it's like it looks like someone's doing one of those old like magic tricks that like you teach a six-year-old to like bend a pencil yeah. you know it's just it's flapping like that like just it's very limp and it's just but like it's green and it's but, but it's, it's green and it's not right like you can't really make out what it is and, and you read and then you hear the footsteps and it's someone running and squealing with joy just like ha fuckers you know this guy had cracked open a chem light, like broken it so it lit up green, then took his, took his knife, cracked it open, pulled his pants down, and just like doused himself with it. And it's just like jogging around that the is platoon. That's not a good idea. It, well, <laughs> that is, that's it, how it, you it, grow extra limbs. So, so obviously, you know how this is going to go. Yeah. Yeah, don't we all? <laughs> yeah, so he's 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 running and he's just like, ah, fuckers, yes, yeah, you're, you know, he's like just calling out everybody for meat gazing and everything. So. <laughs> Stop course. looking at my shit. What what's wrong with you? You know, just that kind of stupid shit. And uh, this must be before. Uh, oh, because when did Family Guy come out? Oh no, it was it was it, yeah, it was. I well, Family Guy was out at the time. I don't know if this was from a Family Guy show. I'm not sure. 
Um, but he's running. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. Oh, yeah. You're never, gonna, you're never gonna get me. Greased up deaf guy. Uh, but no, so he's running. So he's running and he's in first platoon. And again, we're sleeping in formation. He makes it about halfway through second platoon and he, it just stops. So he's between second platoon and the CO. And he just like, you just start hearing screaming like, Oh my God. <laughs> It fucking burns. Uh -oh. It burns. There it is. And the entire company just started laughing. And he starts crying. He's like, Carmen up. Quiet. And you can hear everyone going, Nope, not not touching that one. Not going anywhere near it. You brought this on yourself, bro. And like you can hear my company commander is like, deal with it. It's your fault. <laughs> like, he's just yelling out. He's like, I don't give a shit. He's like, like deal with it. Yeah, he's like, I'm not more ain't nobody going over there. And he's like, if you think you're getting out of tomorrow's training for this, you're fucking wrong. <laughs> like it was but we were all laughing and he had he had taken this green fluorescent shit and just doused his his meat and two veg with it i've, I've seen i've seen guys do it moral of the story is don't do that because yeah, apparently right. it burns like write that down kids yeah. don't try this at <laughs> no. home yeah don't do that unless you want like <laughs> chemical burns on your shit he uh plenty plenty of my the guys i was in a platoon with you know, did it maybe put it on their face, maybe put it, put it on their arm, maybe just, you know, to see what happens or, or put it on other people's things. It's because like, infantry guys are way we, more depraved. Actually, now that I think way about more it, depraved. we did it, uh, we did that in Boy Scouts. Did you we, really? We, well, we that explains a lot about Boy Scouts. And, and pour it on stuff like, oh, let's see what happens. <laughs> and then when it's outside of the plastic, it doesn't it, last. It doesn't last long. very long at all. No, that's why you said about it being green, but it wasn't very bright. Yeah, that's, that's you couldn't really was, tell. Like you just saw this yeah. like fluorescent, <laughs> and it wasn't like it was coated. It wasn't like you saw like it was just like the a, Watchman a blue penis little. just like <laughs> flopping around. You know, it was, it was literally like these green dots. We're like, what the fuck is that thing? Like, and you What's hear someone on? running, and you're like. And then as they get closer, you're like, oh, I can kind of make out. Oh, I get it. Okay. I get back it. Back to what we were yeah. doing. That guy's not yeah. important. I'm going to go back to smoking my cigarette now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. So when we were in Iraq, uh, you know, our detainee ops is generally boring overall. But uh, we, we had one of the more exciting missions, but there wasn't a lot of action. I got one. And you got reason, my lighter. The reason I say that, uh, how the military opens beers, uh, the and reason, bartenders. <laughs> yeah, the reason I say that is because uh, we watch the high value guys, uh, so it was kind of kind of neat because we got to experience a side of the judicial system and politics involved in uh, basically eliminating or attempting to eliminate insurgency throughout Iraq. Um, in certain organizations via the people who funded such things. So that was kind of cool, but th the point is that they pretty much just eat, sleep, and go to court. So there's not a lot to do. Make sure that they don't escape. Make sure that nobody invades. And we were inside a compound that was on the fob that was inside of the green zone. So we had like three layers of security. Yeah. Um, so it's boring as shit. <laughs> so you're working 12 hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off. If, um, if we went out there and we ran that mission for say 30 days, you work 12 on, 12 off for 30 days. So yeah. not, not too bad. Not the best. Um, could have been worse, but I was at a little TCP. We had six on 18 off. So I was at a tactical checkpoint. I'd be okay with that. And so you would sit on post for six hours, and then in your 18 hours off, you would either go on a patrol or convoy. Oh, no. no or, no, like, you would you would, <laughs> no. you would, would go do whatever mission needed to be done. So you would do a 17-and-a-half-hour a mission and then a six-hour shift. Yes. Well, not, not at that point in Iraq, no. <laughs> I mean, fuckers. like, in that point in Iraq, they would give us, like, they sometimes they'd give us, like, stupid fucking patrols to go on and be like, hey, we're going to go walk. Uh, so we were, on, we were on the far side of the river from the city that, that we were in. Oh. Just, uh, I think it was like a squad and a half worth of guys. So like 20, like maybe Which 18 is, to 20 this guys. This about the same time I was there. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And nothing was going on. Like we, when we got there, we were training 
training the Iraqis. Like half of our company was like training the IPs and the IAs. My platoon was like tasked with guarding the bridge, which was like a major vital point to get from, you know, like Syria or wherever yeah. into the inside of Northern Iraq. Yeah. So it was a, it was a vital thing. And so our mission was at first just, you know, we're going to sit there and just go on patrols. And, uh, you know, about halfway through that deployment, they were like, okay, we're no longer going to go on patrols because the Iraqi army and the Iraqi police now have it and they're going to do everything. We're just going to be like here if they need us. We're going to be their QRF. And, um, but we would go on these stupid fucking things out in the desert. They'd be like, hey, you need to go find these poo sites. And, you know, poo sites are a point of origin. Because, um, you know, the Cobb would get indirect fire uh, occasionally. Yeah. And so they would want us to, and we knew it was coming from our side of the river. Yeah. So they'd be like, hey, go walk in the desert because we think it's coming from this general grid square on a map. And go yeah. walk that grid square and see if you can find any remnants of the mortar attack that happened yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And they were just fucking bullshit. So there was a bath party house right outside of our, like a mansion, right outside of our TCP, like maybe. 400 yards or so sure. so we we knew where we would go on patrol so we'd walk into that house we'd sit down in it like no one was in there we'd like go up to the roof on like a nice day and like take our shit off and like tan or whatever and just sit there and hang out and smoke and joke and every like 30 minutes we just cause it call in like fake pause reps we'd be like yeah stand by for me you know? and like we would, so we would have the map we'd be like this is where we told them we're gonna go so we're like we're at this position moving this way still found nothing and like then we call and be like, okay, we're RTB. And then we'd sit there for another 30 minutes and we'd be like, yeah. all right, time to, time to, time to go out. Yeah. Your dog's going nuts. Yeah. He's got a uh, separation anxiety. Yeah. Uh, you can, can actually hear that. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can probably hear it. It's very high pitched. I wonder if I give him a treat, if that'll calm him down. Maybe. Well, you can edit this part out. Yeah. Well, we're, we're still live. But oh, are we live? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do live without you. Oh, there's the dog. Oh, God. Hi, puppy. Hi. 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 Oh, you're so tiny. What branch were you in? He was in the branch of I shut the fuck up and pet me. <laughs> he was in the branch I found in the front yard. Yeah. Come here. Ugh. Event eventually, he'll probably just go and... Uh, Sit on the couch and watch Scrubs or oh, Malcolm in the Middle. Stick. <laughs> was it South Park? <laughs> Red Rocket! Red Rocket! Red Rocket! Oh my god! With that thing coming out, I don't want you jumping up on me. All right, he's fine uh, now. He'll probably he saw people. He thought he was alone. So. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah, um. So so, anyways, while we were in Iraq, uh, guarding that courthouse, which was also like seven or eight stories high, and we stayed on the top. And of course, even if there was an elevator, I don't think we were allowed to use it, or it was broken or some shit. I wouldn't. I wouldn't trust an Iraqi elevator. I just yeah, wouldn't well, do it. I too, just yeah. wouldn't do it. I'd be like, no. So we're in the alcove during Chow time, and we get Chow, uh, kind of like um, what Casey talked about yesterday. There was like this truck that they had acquired. Um, we got given an F one fifty. It was stick shift. That was my second time ever driving a stick shift vehicle, and. Uh, Let's just say the emergency brake didn't work. It was pretty funny. Um, so, anyways, we drive down and get the. So you're not drifting, back. is what you're saying. Yeah, you're not. Well, you're not just going around roundabouts like. Like well, the furthest we had. Fuck to you, drive. Fast and Furious Tokyo <laughs> Drift. Get your fucking heart out. Well, the furthest we had to go in that F one fifty was from the courthouse to the the chow hall to pick it up, so that everyone could eat because we couldn't leave our posts just to go eat, and there was really only enough people there for twelve hour shift. And then sleep, and then rotate. So, uh, we would go pick it up. It was probably a quarter of a mile, okay, maybe half. Come back, a uh, few speed bumps in there. Um, deliver the chow, and then of course we got enough for everybody. So it's like the uh, the mermites with the locks on the side. Okay, like hot chow, you know, yeah, like yeah. what they stored in that. Yeah, and then like a case. So we would get like a case of milk or a case of chocolate milk or a case of juice or maybe like one of each. And it's the cardboard with the plastic over top. And so a lot of times, you know, this you're talking about milk, Joe, that, you know, 
it has a shelf life of 18 years, you're like, that's gross. And you're like, there's no way this is real milk. So most people didn't touch it. But there's one guy, but he didn't touch it because he liked milk. He touched it for the reaction. Oh. So he takes it out to the Alco. There's some rocks right there. And he did the gallon challenge. Oh. What was possibly either not real milk or Are you doing who, who knows what. It was cold. Was it? Was it? First of all, was this winter time in Iraq or was this summertime in Iraq? Because that's, that's going to make question. the that's going to make the whole difference of this story. Was it 120 degrees on the deck or was it well, you know it 80? It wasn't, it wasn't 120 because uh, it was at night. Oh, okay, so I I know it wasn't that bad. I I want to say it was a little bit closer to fall, maybe winter. Oh, so well, yeah, okay. I, I don't remember, but I do remember that uh, he lost. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't win the gallon <laughs> challenge. No one has ever well, been like, I'm winning there. the gallon we're, challenge. But we're not sitting there reading. It's boxes. Yeah. It's like juice boxes, but it's milk. Nobody's reading the measurement and then calculating how many of these for a gallon. So this entire case, I mean, if I had to estimate, I'd say it was about two gallons. It could have been four gallons worth of milk. It's a case. It's a big case of these little boxes of milk. And he's just drinking them. So oh. at some point, oh. if he doesn't stop, oh, it was it was going to end anyways. I'm vomiting a little just listening to this story. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 coming up a little bit. It's like <laughs> it's right there. So much milk. That is gross. So that's that's how exciting so, our yeah, I mean, deployment was. I mean, so my Iraq deployment was pretty much the same way. We had this TCP that had a generator. So like I say, you know, I tell people I'm like, oh, we lived in this TCP. We lived in these like connex boxes you know like the shipping container things so they had like made doors and put in eight but they put in ac units into each one and you could fit like six guys or four guys or something like that so that was six right because you had two you had two four six so you had two racks running along the long wall two racks of bunk beds and then a bunk bed at the back yeah and um but you had you had ac and then we had a kit one of the connex boxes was our coc which is where all of our radio equipment and um our platoon sergeant slept because he he was in charge of the the that tcp yeah. and then you had a connex box of uh, like a kitchen where we had like a microwave and a shelf with all this food and like good like it wasn't like mres it wasn't like here's your fucking mre no they would bring in like fucking honey buns and, sh- and it was just part of it wasn't shit we had to buy like they would come in with like Gatorade, like, and we had a fridge in there and shit, and it worked. So we had like Gatorades and we had Rippets, which were the shit. Oh, Did you ever have Rippet? The little, yeah. the little. Look, people Dude, like I'm the, telling you, we go into the Dollar Tree <laughs> and they got the big ones for a dollar, and I'm like, they're not the same. They're not the same. Well, well, you get the little Rippets on deployment for free, but in my opinion, a big Rippet for a dollar, like that's a deal. Well, so here's and, the thing, and ninety percent of the civilian population goes, "What's a Rippet?" Yeah. So here's the thing, though. <laughs> I've had the Dollar Tree ones. They not don't the have same. not the same because I go for the citrus caffeine free. That was my Rippet of choice, right? They had the like that was the orange can, citrus caffeine yeah free. i would drink two of those and be i swear to god they put like meth or <laughs> barbiturates of some kind in these things because like, i would drink free oh yeah they were the little orange ones they were the I little orange so ones many ribbons, i don't remember any oh dude i would i would drink like free. i would drink like two they said they're very small letters caffeine free and that's like and i was on this whole like all protein diet at the, so when i like i lost a lot of weight in iraq and came home like shredded and but I, so I would drink these because I was like, oh, caffeine free, less sugar. And I would drink those on post and I would be on my six hour post like, okay, okay, what do we, and it's the middle of the fucking night. There's nothing going on. So I just be like up there doing jumping jacks and shit. And I would be up for so long on like two rippets in the six. Hour. Yeah. On these little like, like the shots. I mean, I remember like they'd be yeah, gone yeah, in like yeah. two they golfs, like, like they're big. like that big. Yeah. And I would take two of them, like not at the same time. I take one when I started post and about halfway through post, I take another and I would be up. Like I'd come off post at 6 a.m. and I'd go into the COC and be like, hey, 
what are we fucking what's, doing to do it? What's next? Let's do this. I, I felt like Ty, I felt like Tyrone from the Chappelle show. I'd be itching my neck. <laughs> like, what we got going on today, man? Let's do this because I ain't tired. Let's go. Let's be like, oh, we don't have you anything don't, until this afternoon. Any of them rip it? You no, know, yeah. So like, I would get <laughs> off post at six a.m. and I'd be like, what are we doing? What are we doing? I'd be like. Oh, we're not doing anything? Fine. Fuck it. I'm going to go work out. And we didn't have, like, we had, like, a makeshift gym. Okay. Like, but it had, like, a bench press yeah. and, like, some dumbbells. And then we, like, makeshift a pull-up bar. And we had, like, a little piece of plywood with jump rope. And then we put walls around our TCP, around the exterior. Yeah. Like, the big, tall jersey barrier type yeah. things. And so, we calculate if you ran around it 26 times, that was three miles. So, like, I would go and work out. And I would get done from workout, and I'd be like, "All right, what else can we do?" Like, oh, we gotta go on a patrol. Let's do this. Yeah, get my gear. Woo! Like you're just like fucking hyped on this shit. And I would come down so hard from those. Like it would come down to like six or seven o'clock at night, and I haven't had one since like three in the morning. Yeah. And I would just be like, crash. Like, oh, I'm dumb, dumb. And I just hit the pillow and just fucking be done. So, and I, I so swear to I God, like they would. Put, I don't. I swear to God, they put something in those repets because I've had I a Dollar Tree I repet. Be surprised. Oh yeah, I had a Dollar Tree repet. No effect. Not the same. No effect on yeah. me. None. I I wouldn't be surprised, and this is why because similar to your story, but the difference is, I just wanted to see how many I could have. Oh my god! In one shift, um, I want to say the number was nine. Bad idea. Oh yeah! I not only didn't sleep very well, your heart probably exploded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then the next day, once the once the crash hit, I was like, "Yeah, oh I, yeah, I can't stay stay awake." You cry like I can remember going on some long convoys, like really long convoys, like stupid bullshit things, and they would have like rippets and Gatorade in the cooler. And I would just drink a rip it and be like, all right, oh, 18 hour convoy? Not Ready to go. Fucking problem, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Let's do this. I'm telling you, though, like now that you bring it up, they were like maybe the size of two five hour energy drinks. Oh, uh, yeah. Like they were like tiny. Four like ounces. you would you would finish it in like two gulps. Yeah. And I've had the ones at the Dollar Tree and they ha do not have the same effect on me. They don't. Like I came home and I told, I remember telling someone about Rippets when I came home from Iraq. One of my, they're like, so they're like, what are you talking about? No, they were like, they were like, they're at the, they're, dude, I know some like country bumpkins and they were like, dude, those are at the dollar store, man. <laughs> I was like, fuck yeah. I went and bought a case of them All right. and they were in the big can. I was like, I'm going to be fucking jacked. Like I drank one and I'm like waiting for it to kick. I was like, it was like going from heroin to methadone. Like <laughs> I was waiting for the high. I was just like, not here. It's not coming. It's like, never came. It's like, what is the story of, uh, back in the day when they used to feed the, the Germans, the chocolate. And oh yeah, like, like the bar they had barbiturates in it yeah. so they could go and do like their, their whole, so they could be up thing. forever. Yeah. yeah. I swear to God, like I wouldn't put it past our government and be like, here's a rip it. Here's a rip it. It also has meth in it. <laughs> but it's a micro dose, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's not going to show up in a drug test. You're, you'll be all right. <laughs> or, or they just overlook it. Yeah, that's, that's standard. That guy's following a. But I mean, the thing is, like, not everybody drank that. So, so in deployment, I drank ribbits because they were at the defect, they yeah. were part of Chow. Uh, but we had this other guy who was so funny, man. <laughs> he would go to the PX. Because, mind you, you know, our deployments were comparable, but we were on BBC. So we had, like, you know, air conditioning and Cinnabon. Oh, yeah. He would go to the big PX, and he would buy a case of Monster. Fobbit Life AC. And which I, I want to say was, uh, I, I mean, I probably would have taken Fobbit Life. We still I loved Fobbit Life. Compared to Afghanistan. So when I went to Afghanistan, I was I would long for the days of Iraq in Afghanistan. Yeah. I'd be like, man, I really fucking miss Iraq right now. Yeah. Like this shit fucking sucks. So so we made fun of the people who never left the wire. Yeah, they were we Fobbits. Left, yeah, because we left the wire almost every single day. Yeah. But we left VBC wire. So so it's like even if we went to IHT and ran a 30 day mission in 30 days we come back to Victory Base Complex we got the comfort but he would go to the PX and he would get a case of Monster 
probably fifty dollars, give or take, yeah. the full size monsters and drank them. And then at one point, I feel like one person had like one sip of monster and then was a heat casualty. And my platoon sergeant is like, "No more monster. You can't drink it." And blah blah blah. And oh, so, oh, group punish? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Group punish was a thing in the military. This guy. So this, because I swear to God, this guy didn't have anything but monster. But he didn't have issues like that. Yeah. He didn't have heat casualty issues. So now he's like smuggling monster. That's fine. We had a rumor. My sergeant major, the sergeant major of my battalion in Iraq, was a heat casualty in a egg seed up armored Humvee. That was the rumor that floated around anyway. Oh, I was going to say, if I was him, I would have never admitted to any of that. Oh, no, he was he was like a heat casualty in, on like, uh, in a AC, because we didn't have a lot of AC stuff back then. Who, who was this, you said? This was our uh, battalion sergeant major. So the nah, senior enlisted guy in the battalion had, nah. was like a heat case. Like, the rumor was, and I don't know if this was true. Like, I got to say that because it's getting, you know, recorded and yeah, gone yeah, out yeah, live. Yeah. This was the rumor, and there were always I don't I'm uh, with every deployment. There's always these crazy fucking rumors that go around. Hundred percent. Like I can't tell you how many times I heard about like J Lo dying or Paris Hilton dying or Lindsay. Like just take any like beautiful woman who was out like famous back in those days, or you could do it now. Like I'm sure there's a guy sitting in Afghanistan who's been told Taylor Swift or whoever the fuck is you know in yeah. pop culture has died. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure that person has lived through, you know, being told that a few times. But I, we heard, I heard at one point, someone, I remember being, I had gone on a patrol. Yeah, we had, this is one of the patrols. We actually went into the city where we had to cross the fucking bridge. Huh. And we went on a patrol and then we go back to um, the other side of, um, we stop in at our, like our other platoon, our other half of the platoon. Huh the other side of their and we stop at their tcp and guys are we come in and guys are sitting there and smoking and joking we're catching up because we you know it's like we hadn't seen them in months and months being separated by a kilometer long bridge and you're just kind of like hey what's going on you know guys you've trained with you. <laughs> and some somebody was like fuck did you hear about sorry Major? i was like what the fuck happened to sorry Major? like i was like did you get hit by an ied what the fuck happened and they're like nah dude the motherfucker was a heat case I was like, oh, that's why we're having to like pound water yeah. the way we are. It's like, yeah, but he was a fucking heat case in a fucking AC Humvee. And I'm like, bullshit. And they're like, no, bro. I know a guy with headquarters company. Like, yeah. That like, a guy. Yeah, it's always a guy that knows a guy. It's true. We saw it on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's exact. <laughs> this was Facebook before Facebook. So I got I to gotta be honest with you because everybody makes fun of the lieutenant who shows up to the unit, goes the to bar? load the magazine, and puts it in upside down and yeah, backwards. Yeah, the, the you know? butter bar. Yeah. Everybody makes fun of that guy. But we were in Iraq, and I want to say- You didn't have the, you didn't have the, the what is the ditty is what we called them, like the ditty of brass to the grass. So when you load your magazines and your pouches, you put the brass to the grass. So when you go to pull them out, and you pull them out and flip them up like that, the bullets well, yeah, automatically but, up. Uh, well, back- Back at the line unit in the United States, like you didn't really have to worry about that because your shit wasn't. It was like the ammo was just there. Oh yeah, no. You get it from the ammo point, you carry it to your oh, no, shooting we, position. But but in yeah. Iraq, it was different. You had a basic combat load. It was like that. Yeah, we, we did. What we did is we would tape the 550 cord on the bottom of the magazine. Oh yeah, we didn't. You need, like you Velcro up and you pull the loop out. Yeah, we didn't do any of that. Like we trained, so and I think that's my. I, I don't know if this is the so difference you, between. You took the phrase "train like we fight." Yeah, one so percent. Like a lot of our training was when. So I shot a lot in the Marine Corps, um, in the infantry. Like I would go into a training evolution for a week, and my four years in the Marine Corps, I probably put out. A f I, mean, I don't even know a fuck ton of rounds whatever that equates to I a think, fuck ton no, um, I think what the words you're looking for are a metric ton because I, I no, it, ha it was it was way more than a metric ton so a fuck ton yeah like okay. we would do so we would go out to <laughs> I mean like literally it was like every other week we were on a live fire range nice like every other week and some of the live fire ranges weren't like with the Ivan targets, they would just set up paper targets and you would literally load 
like one magazine with like three rounds and another magazine with two rounds yep. and you would just do failure to stop drills. Yeah. And you would do that for hours. Dude. Fucking this, hours. This right here is the type of shit I wish I had done. Like, like you were just. Cause, you're, Cause that's infantry. So like when I went through SRT school and I got to an MP line unit where we had, you know, either the budget or the planning or whatever to go to the range to do stuff like that. I was like, this is awesome because what we're doing is so we're, fucking lame. It was so lame. Like I like shooting, but I after like while, it, I like it because it takes people who may never see that situation and gives them a little bit of an idea of what to do if they run into the situation. Remember, I was an MP, so we had females. Yeah. So you're talking about people, people who have never touched a gun, people whose Ooh. gun was bigger than them. You know, yeah. trying to learn, okay, do I charge it? Like, what do I do? Do I? Yeah, I think they were called EMP shoots or failure to stop. So we would do, so like you'd have the, the, uh, what is it? The range, the RSO, the range safety officer, yeah. who was usually one of us. Yeah. Like he was usually a, a sergeant, staff sergeant or, you know, whatever. And he would read the instructions and he would say, okay, on this, when you hear my first whistle, you will put two rounds into the target on the left center mass then you will put two rounds into the target on the right you will do a speed reload drill and then put one round into the t-box on the right and then the left so you were literally going from you're basically doing a box and that's why we call them box drills or failure to stop so you go center mass left center mass right face essentially the t which is like the eyes the yeah, nose yeah, yeah. all the way down to the chin and you do one shot to the T and then one shot to the T. So you were, you were working from here going that's over infantry. up and then, yeah, that's what we would do. No, that's and, crazy. And I'll tell you why, because, uh, so when I went through SRT school, which SRT is special reaction team. Yeah. So it's like, um, the military SWAT school. I went through phase one and phase two. They, th that's where we learned the T zone. It's funny. Cause you know, who taught me how to shoot a Marine, a gunnery sergeant. So the, and, but now Marines are good shooters, man. They really are. Now it's, it's only kind of ironic because there was an air force guy, a gunnery sergeant, two civilians and a Navy guy on the, I will put up Pogue Marines against training any unit. other unit and they, they'll be able to shoot like well, that's well, crazy. So I, I had the opportunity to possibly train with any of them. I ended mm -hmm. up with the gunnery sergeant. He was cool as shit. Um, but he, most gunnery sergeants, I will tell you, most gunnies are fucking cool as hell. Most of them are like, we had this thing. So we have to roll our sleeves in the summer or we used to, I don't know if they still do like, and there's a way to roll them. Like you, they have to be tight. They have to be like two inches above your elbow. The fold has to be like three fingers wide or whatever. They have to be flat. So there's like a whole like way to fold them. Yeah. And the I know Army for started doing that recently. Fuck you for copying us. <laughs> they were like, um, wait. I, well, we stopped it for was a lot. Better. We stopped it for a little while. And um, like the guys who came in as I was EASing. So like my junior guys were their senior guys. Yeah. Those guys never learned to roll sleeves. And we did it for like the Marine Corps did it for a very short period of time. And then they decided, fuck that. We're going back to it. Um. So they said, so no these, rolling. these, like this one small generation of Marines, like had no, had never been trained how to do it. And so like my senior guys had to train them how to like roll sleeves. Like, cause there's like, there's a thing, like you've got to well, like, the army did it. I want to say like desert storm. I, I think up until like 2001, I have no idea. The army did it. That's BDUs. what it is. we were. Yeah. So uh, well, we, when I enlisted, they were like, no. Nah, yeah, our BDUs, like our BDUs is what we rolled. We rolled our camis. So like summertime, the uniform of the day is if you were in camis, like garrison, you were in, when you, you had to roll your sleeves. Wintertime when you were, so, and you were in your desert camis. You were in your desert camis. Um, wintertime is when you went to your green camis and you didn't roll your Um, But back to gunnies, like we had this, there was this phrase called the gunny roll fucking gunnies didn't give a shit <laughs> like they were like and like most gun i will say out of out of the gunnies that that i i don't think i ever looked at a gunny 
that was like, this motherfucker doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, right? Like, no. all the gunnies that I ever interacted with. I mean, because you know, were, when I went through training, the Marine MP school was the army it, all, the I, mp school was all the same it was marines and army it's all so a pogue unit to me man i don't know <laughs> it's all a pogue unit to me well, i don't give a well, shit what's, I, great, I don't... what's great about that is sometimes we had civilian instructors sometimes we had army instructors sometimes we had marine instructors yeah and so it's i mean it was crazy because we had a gunnery sergeant teach one of our classes gunnies i don't like, know what it is about you will address me and he was like it's gunnery sergeant. None of this because what we would do, <laughs> and I think it's, I think it's part of being in the army as well as like they wouldn't let you call them gunnies. It was that we wouldn't drag it out. So in basic training or AIT yeah. or whatever, it was like, yes, drill sergeant. Mm -mm. And he was like, if you do that shit. I'm going to get with your drill sergeants and you will do push ups until I get tired. Yeah. Push until your arms get tired. <laughs> no, I mean, like, all the gun, like, we called all of, and so here's the thing about gunnies that I, that is my experience in the infantry. Right? Yeah. E5 is a sergeant, E6 is a staff sergeant, then you go to gunnery sergeant. No. So, yeah. Um, they were, so gunnies were the kind of the people who got the guys who got us what we needed. Yeah. Like they were kind of, they beans were bullets. Yeah. They got us the beans and bullets. And so every gunny I ever interacted with was just, I just, I had the utmost respect for him. And, and there's a thing about rank and I don't know if this is true in the army, but there's this thing about rank in the Marine Corps where like you have your private PFC Lance corporals, and you have senior lance corporals. Yeah, that's right. That's a thing. It's an unspoken thing, but it's a thing. Okay. And so a it's senior because like, lance corporal is E four, right? Yeah, uh, it's an E three. E three. Corporal is an E four. So the cutting score in the infantry at the time that I was in, like to be, uh, to get pick up corporal, uh, meritorious or make it through just pure cutting score, not time and service, but cutting score was like fucking high yeah. it was like 13 or 1400 which was insane like the highest cutting score was like 1500 so like you had to do a bunch of shit to pick up corporal um whereas like i knew a guy who was uh a weapon like he was one of the dudes that loaded missiles onto a uh helicopter like that was his job in the marine corps he picked up sergeant in like two years like that's unheard of in the infantry especially at that time like you just you did not it's, hear that it sounds comparable you know it's different yeah but it's like we would have mos's where we, you would see somebody that was like two years time in service and they're a sergeant e5 dude i've seen you're like how in the fuck did they do that i had i i'll never we, we I'm, actually have a friend uh they're they're a combat uh photographer mm -hmm. how many of those do you think exist Actually, I grew up with a guy who was an army combat photographer in really? the reserves. Yeah, or National like, Guard I, reserves. I, I National Guard. Zach, like I'm sorry, I don't know those. what you're wearing. Yeah, I ran into like one of those while I was in. So, so she went off. She, be, you know, she made E5 as soon as she was eligible. Yeah, which which E5 Sergeant E5 in the army is the one that takes effort. It's the one that's like this many points. But then again, minimum points. I want to say minimum points in, in, in the army might be like. 300 um i well I, I i can't remember the exact but our cutting score to pick up corporal was fucking high was so fucking high like you at, at, in the in the infantry pretty much you had to have time in service yeah like that's how you picked up corporal in the infantry there were so few guys so i know marvel and carney are two guys i know that picked up corporal and they came in with us. I'm trying to think. That's Tanner. Funny. It sounds like your corporal, which is E4, yeah. is similar to the Army Sergeant E5. Tanner, I think, picked up corporal well, uh, before Afghanistan. Marvel picked up before Afghanistan. I think Carney picked up in Afghanistan. Tanner picked up, I think, <laughs> prior to Afghanistan. And nicely. 
nicely picked up prior to Afghanistan. Those are the four guys that I can think of that yeah. I were my generation yeah. that picked up Corporal. Out of a hundred some odd people, four. <laughs> like that's fucking insane. Like, yeah. and those were sh- those guys were fucking awesome dudes. Like, and they were great fucking Marines. Um, you know, I think Marvel was like Marine of the Quarter or something. So he like went to a no. So he got like accolade. Like he was a he was a shit hot Marine. Uh, all of them were actually. I mean, all all of those dudes were fucking shit hot Marines. Um, but those are the only guys I can think of that picked up. That picked up Corporal. That picked up. Uh, you know, I like. I don't know if I told you the story. Like two days after IEAS, they mailed me my my promotion warrant for. So I asked on in January, like January 29th, On February one, I got promoted to Corporal. Congratulations! Which was fucking. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> like I don't fucking care. Like I didn't give a shit. I was like, oh, yeah, I think I, I do remember getting fucking the shit scared out of me because yeah. I I was living in a house in Wilmington. I pulled into my driveway, and as I pull into my driveway, I can see on my front porch there's this Manila envelope, and so I I park in the garage and everything, and I go out and around to the front porch to pick. I'm like, okay, my wife ordered fucking something. Amazon. Yeah, whatever. And I like, I look at it, and as I walk up to the front porch, there's the Eagle Globe and Anchor on the return address, and I'm like, oh, motherfucker, I better not be getting stop lost. I, I am not playing this I'm fucking by, game. Like, <laughs> I, I, start, I was like, my, I, I, I've been on terminal for like 40 days. Dude, that And I EAS. Oh, no, it wouldn't like, be funny. It would sick. not. No, what would be funny is you like on the front porch burning it, and somebody showing up being like, hey, man, that's your promotion. No, I I remember no, ta- I you. I looked at a breath and I was like, oh my god, what the fuck do they want me to do? Now? <laughs> I was like, Jesus, I need you. Like, I don't believe in you, Jeebus, but I need you right now. Um, so, but I opened it and it was the the red thing, and I was like, oh, this must be my like EAS certificate because sure. I thought they gave us an EAS certificate. Yeah. They don't. Your EAS certificate is like your DD two fourteens. Yeah. Um, I didn't get something mailed to me until I EOS after my four years of IRR were done. Um, because you got to do a you have to I, in the Marine so Corps you had to do eight years. So we use that's the same across branches. Okay, it's eight years, but we say ETS, which is end tour of service. Yeah, yeah, end of active service is EAS, okay. and then you, okay, okay, EOS is a, um exit of service. Okay, that exit makes of more sense. A, end of service. Yeah, end of service. I don't know. There's so many fucking acronyms. Sure. Uh, whatever. I've yeah. always heard EAS when it relates to the Marines, but I was like, sure, ETS, it's the same thing. But yeah. for us, I mean, so for me, I didn't have to deal with that. I was yeah. in for 10 years. Yeah, I know. Like, I had to do it. I was, I, a, out, I was a four. So I did. So I joined the Marine Corps. Like, so I was a bored 22 year old. Like, literally, I was like, I don't like, I was in college. I was going into my senior year. Every anything else? Yeah, everybody <laughs> I knew was like, I'm, "We're going to graduate this year, and this is what I'm going to go and do, and this is what I'm going to go and do." And people were like, "What are you going to do when you graduate?" And I was like, I, "I don't fucking know. Like, I don't. I haven't thought that far ahead. Like, I've never been asked that. Question like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, like, I don't fucking like. How the fuck do you have a plan? Like, uh, like people had plans for their lives, and I was like, Yeah, I I have none of that." I don't I know. I was just going to graduate and yeah. go work at Applebee's. Like, I, was, <laughs> I was taught, like, literally, so I grew up, so this is this is growing up North Raleigh, like, you grow up, you go through school, you graduate from high school, and then you go to college. That right. is what you do. Yeah. Like, if you don't, like, I can remember being in high school and being like, I don't, I hate fucking school. I don't want to go to college. College seems like fucking stupid to me like i've been in school for the last 18 years of yeah. my fucking life i don't want to go to fucking 100%. college and everyone's like oh well you'll amount to nothing and you'll go to-. i had a guidance counselor in middle school tell me i was either going to end up dead or in jail like i was like because well, i did mean, because i told Marines, him so yeah kind of kind of you know, the same it's thing it's kind of like jail <laughs> but like they were like this is what, like if you don't do this this is this is what happens to you and i'm like those are my options college early death or jail like this seems like shit to me but it was just kind of ingrained into you and so when it came time to like graduate i was like and there were other things that went on that i'm not going to get onto on a podcast (laughs) and you and i have discussed those yeah yeah yeah. um but there were so but i just was like fuck it man i'm 
I'm, and I knew I wasn't going to be a career Marine. I, I just, I joined the Marine Corps because I wanted to see if I could do it. Because all everyone I knew before I went into the Marine Corps was like, you, 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 you are not going to make it. You were not going to make it through boot camp. Like you're just not going to do it. And I'm a stubborn motherfucker, and I'm like, I will fucking prove you wrong. Like, <laughs> all right, cool. And like the easiest way to get me to do something is to be like, no balls, bro, no balls. And I'll be like, fucking done and doing it. Like <laughs> two deployments later. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, well, and also at the time, I like, get here. So I was like 22. I'd been overseas. Like I'd done a study abroad program, and I followed like you know politics and especially foreign policy and i was like i remember telling my mom i was like i'm going to the marine corps she's like well just go as an officer I'm like first of all no because i feel like if i'm going to get so i felt like if you were an officer you went into like special forces you had to make it a career because yeah. you were just devoting so much time and tra training just to get to the jumping off point right yeah. and i was like i'm, I'm not doing that and I remember like how do how I just like how I was like easing my mom into the conversation I was like, Mom, Iraq's over. Like I remember uh, like I was a senior, I graduated high school when we invaded Iraq. Like I like I was like, Iraq's over with, it's done. And Afghanistan is special forces. Like there's nothing going on in Afghanistan. Like no. unless you're in like a SEAL team or a Ranger or Green Beret, or whatever. What, what year did you graduate? In high school? From high school? Or college, whatever. I graduated from high school in 03. Okay. Um, uh, that, I never graduated that round of college because I dropped <laughs> the fuck out. Uh, so, I told, you know, I was like, oh, you know what, I may go to Iraq or Afghanistan. I definitely won't do both. And if I go to Iraq, nothing's happening. Yeah. Like this was my kind of naive, uh, just me being naive, like listening to the media. This is where I found out the media lies. <laughs> like, this is where I find out like, all right, they're full of shit. Um, and I'm like, all right, cool. Well, I'll, I'll just do that. I, cause I had just come home from studying abroad in London and I really enjoyed traveling. The Marine Corps ruined that for me. Thanks. Bin Laden. Um, <laughs> But I really like traveling. So, like, while I was in London, we would go, like, I went to Paris, I went to Amsterdam. You know, I kind of went around, you know, I went around all of the UK, or, or, well, not all the UK, but a bunch of the, and I really loved it. Like, I enjoyed yeah. being in London and, like, seeing new, you know, all this crazy shit. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I, I had always wanted to join the Marine Corps. Like, when we were kids growing up in the woods and we, you know, we'd go out and play in the woods and shit. People would be like, oh, we're going to go play Army. And I'd be like, oh, you guys are playing Army. I'm playing Marines because they're better than Army. Um, <laughs> just And it's just because of like, the yeah, you know, and it's A, because it's true. Yeah. Deal with it. <laughs> uh, it. But B, because, you know, just so much, you know, growing up, I really liked uh, my, one of, some of my favorite movies were like Heartbreak Ridge, uh, Full Metal Jacket, and the first half of Full Metal Jacket. Like the second half, I can like, li like le take it or leave it. Like, I, I, but the fucking whole training scene, like, and that is what boot camp is like. Yeah. You know, like, that is pretty much it. Like, if you want to get something close to what boot camp is like for Marines, full metal jacket, watch it. That shit still happens, whether they want to say it or not. That fucking shit happens. So, I, except I, for, except for being able to have access to live ammunition um in the yeah. in the barracks but like yeah you do yeah you you do fucking stupid shit and I, your drill instructors will fuck with you i worked with a guy at a plumbing company after i got out of the army he was marine yeah he um was like a fucking journalist or some shit for the marines and he went in so he was escorting or lee army on a deployment and they come into a room and it, or, it was either a deployment or a training unit or something. He borrows a hat. He takes it. They're actually watching the movie when this is happening. And so when the scene comes on, he just starts walking around. Arlie Ermey yeah. just starts walking around the room yeah. screaming. Guy. But what I love about that is like it's his movie. Yeah. And then he's walking so you around. Know how he got and all the Marines just shit their pants yeah. like, so oh, our so Arlie like, Army was actually our guest speaker at my last ball, my my last Marine Corps ball. 
Did you get his autograph? I didn't because there oh, was just man. he was when he he did his speech. I'll never forget this. He did his so first of all, she was my girlfriend at the time. She is now my wife. I didn't want to go to that ball. Like I hated balls. Like for me, there was for me there was a certain idea of a marine, and and it wasn't what the Marine Corps thinks a marine is. Yeah. For me, it was the guys who were like at like Quezon and Way and Chosen and Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal, like they were just hardened motherfuckers. Like they weren't shaving their faces. They weren't this like crew cut type dudes. They were just fucking let's get like, let me roll my fucking sleeves up and go fight. For me, that's what the idea of a Marine was. Yeah, It wasn't this guy who was prim and proper. And, And in the Marine Corps, that's what they tell you. Like, this is what a Marine is. Yeah. And for me, going into it and how I kind of judged the Marine Corps was like, I, I, I don't give a shit how I'm viewed in garrison. Like, I want to be able to, you know, that's kind of like how I viewed the Marine Corps. Yeah. Um, so, but my, so I hated doing all the, do- what I call the dog and pony shows. I hated the ball. The ball yeah. was, like, I get it. Like, I enjoy history and I enjoy the fact of that we still celebrate our history like that. I laughed because you said dog and pony show. Yeah, that's what it is. Pony. It's a that's dog what, and pony that's show. That's what it is. The ball is, the ball is great because you celebrate your history, which I think is important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the oldest and youngest Marine in the, in the, the unit come together and they cut the cake together, which I think is a, is just a good symbolism. Like it's, yeah. it's the passing down because that's how Marines pass down knowledge. Yeah. Right. It's not written in a book that you have to study. An older Marine is telling a younger Marine, this is how it is. Yeah. Um, but I remember um, we went to the ball. It was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which is a fucking shithole. <laughs> um, sorry if you live in Myrtle Beach. I mean, <laughs> it's a fucking shithole. Uh, it's, it's just a tourist trap. Um but we go down to, so we go down and I remember telling, telling my girlfriend, my wife, my, well, my wife, I was like, listen, there is a lot of ceremony with this. Like there's going to be a lot of me standing at attention when I'm standing at attention, I'm not going to be able to talk to you and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, trying to explain kind of the rules to her. Um, but she wanted to go to a ball because she's, she's mary poppins yeah and when she hears the word ball she's like oh i'm gonna be like bella and you know whatever or like i'm gonna be like a princess and i'm like no that's not how any of this is like that's not how this goes like we go for the the ceremony part and yes there's dancing after the ceremony but no one fucking sticks around for that shit yeah after the ball is over we get rip roaring drunk, like right? like just shit faced. Yeah. Like that's what the ball is. <laughs> like what what we do. Like that is. And other units may be different. This is what my unit did. And so, but our so you have a guest speaker, and I don't know how my battalion landed Arlie uh, Army, but he was our guest speaker, and I was like, I'm gonna go fucking see him, and I was drunk as shit. I'll never, I was like drunk as shit. I'm like, I'm going to go see him. I'm going to do it. And like, I go outside and he's standing there and he's talking to a bunch of Marines and stuff. And you can tell he's trying to leave. Like he got his money and everything. And he's trying to, cause he knows what this is as well as the rest of us enlisted guys. These fuckers are, are a wasted and they're going to get more wasted. And I do not want to deal with that shit. <laughs> And uh, I don't want to deal with a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year old kids getting fucking shit bombed. So I was like, I'll go talk to him. Let me get a beer first. I'm going to walk up and grab him a beer. My wife's like, like, let's go dance. I'm like, no, fuck that. We're getting shit faced now. Like, this is what we do. Like, this is, this is and, and, and like, I had staff and CEOs like, let's do shots, motherfuckers. Like, yeah, all right, cool. Um, and I went to the bar. And of course, since the ceremony part was over, the bar was packed. And I'm like trying to muscle my way in there. And like, guys are like, fucking back up the fuck up, dude. I'm like trying to get a shot, bro. And, um, but anyways, by the time I got my drink, I walked back around to where he was and he was gone. And I don't know where he went. Like, I don't know if he stuck around. And, you know, my wife was like, let's go back into the ball. And I was like, 
fuck that mm-hmm. i'm not going back in there because the only thing that's in there right now are officers like i'm not going the fuck in there like that is that is a no-go that is a no-go for me now <laughs> we're gonna go bar hopping and we didn't because she was like well you're in your dress blues let's we got a hotel room let's go have some fun i was like done (laughs) sorry sorry wife uh it's a it's a sad story it is i really right there he was right he was so close and i like really was i went to the bar to get a drink and i was like okay he's like taking photographs and you know signing autographs and whatever i was like i'm gonna go buy a beer let that line thin down a little bit and then i'm gonna go talk to him I never did. And then he di- he died not too much. After, uh, it wasn't too long after that that no. he died. No. And I was like, fuck me. But he was he did give a great speech. Like, he kind of did this. Um, and again, I was drunk for most of this because you drink a lot before you go into the ball. Um, I was at one sober. Yeah, you don't go to the ball sober. That's just. Well, the, the reason is because I was underage and my leadership was there. So I was like, I'm not going to do that. But then after that, it was like there was one in Germany, there was one in Fort Hood. Um, I think there were two at Fort Hood. It didn't matter. Like it didn't matter what your age was in the Marines. Like you drank at the ball, like everybody did. Um, and if if the people who were like if you were at the hotel, so we were at a hotel, like the Renaissance or the Marriott or something. Yeah, I can't fucking remember. <laughs> and um. Pretty much, if you were wearing a uniform, you didn't get ID'd. Yeah. You walked up to the bar, ordered a beer, or a shot, or a shot in a beer, or I'm three sure, shots in a beer. I'm sure it would have been the same for me, but... They just didn't ID you. And, th- and that was just you know, kind of was, the... Un- I was at Fort Polk. I was a brand new PFC. I was... <laughs> if uh, any of, if any guy who came to me and was like, I'm, I'm 19 years old, I can't drink, yeah. I'd have been like, I got you, bro. Go sit over there. <laughs> like Here. Like, <laughs> I'll go order a round of shots. Yeah. And if they're going to check my ID, they're going to check my ID. Every, but everybody drinks. Like, it's, it doesn't matter what your fucking age is. And, I, it, you know, they, sure, I mean, if the, if the state government's going to be like, well, we're going to go down on that hotel for serving underage kids. I'm like, no one's going to do that. These are fucking yeah. infantry Marines yeah, who, yeah, yeah. who are going to Iraq or Afghanistan. They're going to, you know, go do shit at 18, 19 years old, 20 years old that, most people will never even begin to comprehend. Yeah. So no one batted an eye. It was just kind of one of those unwritten rule type things. But yeah, Arlie Army, man. It was uh, Ar- Army. Arlie Army. Yeah, he was my guest speaker. It was pretty fucking rad. And he did the whole like drill. Like he Dude, came I on. I love to have he, seen that. Like, he came he came on and he did this whole like little bit for like five or ten seconds where he did his little bit from Full Metal Jacket. And I was like, I got a boner. I was like, Yeah. I would have. It was uh, awesome. There was a drill sergeant. I think that's uh, weird you guys call him drill sergeant. We call him drill instructors. You, we because they could be sergeant, staff sergeant, gunnery sergeant. Yeah, but correct me if I'm wrong. But you guys also call like staff sergeants, staff sergeant. Yeah, we just call them sergeant, sergeant, staff sergeant, sergeant first class, master sergeant. Yeah, no, we're we, all sergeant. Nope, sergeant, staff sergeant, gunnery sergeant, but first sergeant. First aren't is first aren't master gunners aren't, but uh, he quoted the entire movie from beginning to end during training, and I thought that was fascinating. You didn't have to. It was funny. He was. They didn't need to quote it at boot camp. They could fucking just make it up as they go along. It was pretty much similar. Holy fucking dog shit! The fuck (laughs) is this? You're just like, oh well, that's kind of from the movie. Yeah, and well, he he quoted it. I I feel like the most interesting thing about that was my problem with that movie is they use I, me, and we. Sure, but that's because you experienced. It. Yeah, we don't. You don't do that in boot camp. So, so I was very sheltered growing up, so I didn't see Full Metal Jacket before I went. I told my boss. I was a waiter at Cracker Barrel uh, while I was in college before I joined the Army. I told him I was uh, joining the Army, and he said, have you seen Stripes? 
Stripes like, oh. is an awesome movie. I was like, it's no, fucking I haven't. great. I love Bill like, Murray. You gotta watch it before you leave for training. So I saw Stripes before I left for training. <laughs> not true to life at all. I mean, it's not true at all. I I wouldn't think. I think I agree with that though. Like watching it before you enlist. Yeah. Because it's like after you enlist, you're like, well, that's not going to happen. That's not true. That's not going to. Oh, happen. the Marine Corps ruined any military movie. Like my wife can't watch military movies with me. Yeah, not at all. And it's like, not because no, no, yeah, no, because I'm no, sitting there no. like no, no. And I'm like, oh, you're putting that fucking ribbon on top of that one. What the fuck is wrong with you, you piece of shit? Like I'm like. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this guy's got his, you know, Iraqi campaign badge above like his fucking purple heart. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Unfuck yourself, you piece of shit. Like, <laughs> I'll sit there and like watch movies and be like, doesn't happen. Not true. Nah, -uh, not even close. Nope. I will say the closest things I've seen to military life yeah. is anything done by like vet TV and as, as dark and as, as like I love and I hate vet TV. I love and hate it because. I love it because I'm like, well, it's fucking wasn't funny Donnie as shit. O'Malley a, a Marine? Yeah, he was a Marine. Yeah, yeah Like yeah. I love, I like, I love it because I get the humor. And then I think to myself, I'm like, holy shit, is someone I love and care about going to fucking see their shit and then come to me and be like, have you seen that vet TV? Those yeah. guys are fucking psychotic. And I'm like, no, they're fucking great, man. <laughs> and they're gonna be like, uh, we need to lock my uh, husband or yeah. you know whatever up. Yeah. I'm like, Ugh. that's why I love and hate vet TV because I'm just like. I'm just like, oh man, I'm just, I'm so worried someone's going to come to me and be like, is this how all veterans are? And I'm going to like, try not to laugh and tell them no. Um, I mean, it, but it, 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 it is, it I is, mean, uh, it is on fucking point. I mean, it, it really, truly, it, it is. Yeah. Um, anything black rifle does is on point. I yeah. think for like what I love, like the vets versus like horror movies. Like when they do that, huh? have you seen this? I don't think so. so I know oh my Matt, god, you've got to watch so it. Matt Best is the the founder of Black Rifle. He well, he's one of the founders. So it's so him, Evan Hafer, yeah, and then Jared. Because I think I they were on his last uh, name. Joe Rogan. Yeah, but I listened to uh, Matt Best when he does his like rap battles. Yeah, they're funny as shit. Yeah, but funny no, like rogue. when they do stuff, it's like it's it's it's. Those guys never left the barracks, I feel like, because they still live the life of just like an idea pops in their head and there's just like no filter when it comes out. It's just going to come out and they're going to fucking do it. Best in O'Malley. Yeah. Yeah. Um, though, I mean, though, like if you want to see what it's like to be like the vet TV thing is like my favorite thing that vet TV does is not any of the combat shit. Um, it's like the welcome. Have you seen the like Welcome to the Barracks series or whatever? I don't think so. Oh my god, it's fucking great because I'm like, this is how the fuck it is when you walk into the barracks as an infantry marine. Like, you have this one guy who comes to you and he's like, there's this whole like rigmarole where they like this corporal sees this like Lance Corporal saying, Hey, bro, I got you. Just come on. And he's like walking around trying to like just being nice, like thinking he you know this is going to be your friend or whatever and you're like oh yeah great okay and what you don't realize is he's leading you up to the roof to like wrap you in mattresses to throw you off of the fucking <laughs> roof like he's just like welcome to the barracks motherfucker and he just throws you up like this is a series i don't know if it was a series or if they just did the no it's a series because they have like the senior lance uh king or whatever it is uh where he's like wearing a glow belt and a backwards eight point cover and everyone like bows down to him and shit and they're all like my lord and stuff because he's like the senior shitty lance like yeah. that, he probably got promoted at one point and got knocked back down and yeah. is now back into um that's i like it i can't remember what it's i'll have to look it up and show you but it is it is legit marine corps infantry life um, it is the closest thing that I've ever seen, to, and it is so disturbing. Yeah. Like they had it's like hidden video, like yeah. it's pretty legit. That's fucking legit shit. I uh, I have seen uh quite a wide variety from vet tv some of it i get some of I it fucking, i fucking love it man 
Like honestly, I love that TV. I I think it's a a great outlet. It's it's great entertainment. I think it relates to a certain demographic. Oh, absolutely. Which is us. Yeah, I don't want it's like, like <laughs> I don't want like my niece or nephew or any kids to like be, a, be like look at this no. and be like Hey, hey, Dad. Um, are you this fucking crazy? No, uh, this no. is all fiction. This isn't. This isn't how it was. Because I don't want you to know that. Like, I don't want you to be a you know. Because you're a despicable human being when you're in the barracks. Like, you turn into a just a horrid person. Yeah. And it's not because of war or anything. It's ju- it's literally like a frat house that you yeah. don't have to pay to be a part of. You get paid to be a part of it. So it's just yeah. like. I've got so many barrack stories about just just crazy fucking shit that happened. Yeah. Um I can I I remember some guys flipped a gazebo so we when we came over from Afghanistan <laughs> they put us on like what we call the pogue side of Camp Lejeune so we were in French Creek where we used to be at Hospital Point and we were in these like really shitty barracks and the barracks behind us were really nice and they were like communications guys or they were fucking pogues that's all i know (laughs) and i remember one night or one weekend i wasn't there for this but apparently they had a smoking pit that was a gazebo yeah and a bunch of our dudes were just sick of these motherfuckers like trying to be like oh we're fucking marines and you guys are shit bags so they went and fucking picked up this gazebo and like threw it into the middle of the parking lot oh on its side and it was like this huge fucking deal like i remember our sergeant major coming out and was like you can't fucking treat the pogues that way and he's like well even though they're fucking pogues we can't be doing that shit like he's like <laughs> he's like it was fucking hilarious and i'm glad you did it <laughs> But since I'm the one who has all the responsibility, yeah. you can't fucking do that shit. That's funny, but tone it back. I feel like it's like being a dad, like when your kid says something <laughs> to, your, to your wife and you're like, that was fucking hilarious. That's funny as shit. That was the funniest fucking thing I've ever heard. But you're like, no, you can't. No, that's wrong. But I seriously want to give you a high five for saying that shit. Like, well, we'll do it later. We'll, we'll, we'll take care it of it later. Um, funny. yeah that's but that but vet tv is i think the everything else i've ever seen like you can pull out pieces that are like eh, it's kind of yeah. realistic i they, think it just depends because like they've got one show on there that's uh i i feel like it's super heavy air force focused so they also focus on other branches. No, yeah, they do one with like but, Navy corpsmen in the hospital. Yeah, and I'm like, I can't relate to and any you, of that. You watch it and you're like, oh, this is kind of maybe entertaining, yeah. but it's like, man, eh, whatever. I mean, there's funny shit that happens in there, but you're just kind of like, I, I, like, I can't relate to it. Yeah. Like when you see the like, when you see the shit that's like. absolutely 100 percent. i just really like it because they've created a platform a place for us to go a place for oh, people yeah. to get entertainment i really know? just don't hope civilians come up and be like this isn't like i want it to be like the best kept secret among amongst veterans and i'm sure if you like o'malley would be like oh well, i don't want that i want to have it grow and show be like no because i don't want to fucking explain that shit to civilians well i mean if you watch like he gets on stage they hold talk i've, I've never seen that or whatever he gets on stage and he's like it's dur- during uh i think some of the more early episodes it's like oh yeah we've got this going on i saw that i, saw, I and did see the people contribute so so donnie o'malley i saw that did you see the vice news thing with him vice news you know vice news is uh-huh. so vice news is like the biggest communist anti fucking they, they just fuck they're off i hate them uh well now I, what they yeah um they're like a news organization they put out like yeah. a magazine they have this like show they used to have this show on hbo i don't know if they still, but they went and interviewed all the people at vet tv and like they did the story on vet tv and the girl that they sent was like you knew she went into that was just like i am going to make these people look like fucking pieces of shit like what did they send her of all people yeah. like she wears her beliefs on her sleeve 
I remember watching that and I was like, and I remember thinking like, fuck yeah, dude. Like he, he looked at her and he was like, no, I'm going to treat you with respect and I'm going to explain to you exactly what the fuck we're doing. Yeah. And like, she's going to places where like, she's showing people veterans, like these videos, like for on YouTube. And she's trying to elicit a, a reaction, a negative reaction on VetTV, and she's just not getting it. Like, no. people are like, no, that shit's fucking hilarious. Like, we love that shit. And she's like, what is wrong with you? Like, how do you <laughs> like this? This is so, like, derogatory. Like, put any negative ad adjective you can. Um, and that's, that's actually how I found out about what Vet TV was. It popped up in, like, like my, my YouTube what is, feed. What is this called again? Vice? Vice. Vice TV. That's weird. I'll I'll send you I'll send you the clip. It's like when you watch I, it. I feel you like, like I, so so I could be wrong, but I I feel like in a scenario where there's an organization like that. Oh, it's extremely biased. Another media company. Yeah. It's extremely biased. It's extremely Donnie biased. O'Malley. If I was Donnie O'Malley, I would be like, hey, you know what? They're probably not gonna like what we have. Oh, to he say. I, like you can tell, like from but his it's body genuine. language. It's genuine. Yeah. It's genuine. It's like he came he in, he created this media company. He was like legitimately he has, trying to explain it. Like he was like, I like you can tell. Like he didn't say this, but you could tell he was like, these people don't like what I'm trying to do, and I'm going to just remain calm and try and explain this to them in yeah. such a way that they'll understand it. Like yeah. he, that's he's like. He's like, I don't give a shit if you like it or not. Yeah. He's like, fuck you. I don't care. Like, I, you're not my audience. I don't give a shit. Like, yeah. I don't want civilians to watch this shit. I don't care if civilians watch it or not. I mean, if they do, great. But if they don't, fine. They, you know, lamb blast me in the news for it. Fuck them. I don't give a shit. I'm yeah. doing this for people who, who've put on the uniform and have yep. gone through all yep. of this shit because they're going to relate to it. And that's all I care about. And that's what I think I respect most about vet TV is because there are things on vet TV that I just don't get. Like, I'm just kind of like, I guess that's funny. Like, mm. but it's because I don't have that, yeah. that background in the military. Like if when they you, talk about anything infantry, whether it's army or Marine Corps, I'm like, Fucking on point, bro. <laughs> Fucking on point. What I love about it is when he gets on stage, it's during... I can't, I can't remember. It's like a launch of an episode or something like that. He gets on stage, he talks about it, and he puts his arm around the person. Uh, sometimes it's like somebody who was just entertaining or telling jokes or playing guitar or something mm. like that, and he thanks them, and he talks about shit the shit that ta Donnie O'Malley talks about is like, you know, the the people who I don't want to belch on fucking microphone. I mean, shit happens. But he talks about like, people who need like, the camaraderie. He talks about yeah. people who need the support. He talks about how he supports people and the cause of, like, 22 veterans a day committing suicide, which is one thing, like, we have on our resources page. That's one reason why I created the resources page. Yeah. So just the fact that Donnie O'Malley gets up there, he talks about the different causes behind it. So, granted, you watch the shows, and it might be like, maybe you can't relate, or maybe you're a civilian and you get offended by it. Yeah. But at the end of the day... The number one thing, Donnie O'Malley is a huge advocate for irreverent warriors. I don't even know what that is. They do. So Russell Oxley is, and I'm name dropping because he's local. So he is. Russell you Oxley name dropping is, son of a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Because cause I think I, Russell was actually a Marine. So he is the local chapter head of irreverent warriors. And they hold hikes in order to support such causes. And Donnie O'Malley I'd be down to that. In that so, so the thing with me, and I don't know if I'm like the weird one or not in the room or watching or listening for the, you know, two people that do listen to this. Um, I never had a problem really adjusting back to civilian life. And I think that's because yeah. I never fully embraced the Marine Corps as like a lifestyle. Yeah. Right. Like I, um, 
I went into the Marine Corps knowing I was going to be out in four years. Like this, for me, it was a test. It was to see kind of what I was capable of. And that's all it was. It was not, um, you know, in the Marine Corps, you're a Marine 24 hours a day. And of course, and I'm the thing I'm really thankful for. And the thing I'm really, you know, at the same time, really kind of resent about it (laughs) was that I grew up really close to Camp Lejeune. Okay. So when I was home and we would be done for the weekend, we get libo. I'm not staying around fucking Jacksonville. Yeah. That place is a shithole. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is. If, if the base wasn't there, it'd be a bunch of fucking trailer parks and tobacco fields and pig farms and, and chicken farms. That's all that would be there. It's a shithole. Um, the only reason Jacksonville has the size that it does is because of the Camp Lejeune. That is the only reason. Yeah. And it's all like strip clubs, car dealerships, bars, and tattoo parlors. Yeah. So, you know, you don't get the, the best of society there. Um, but on the weekends, I'd be like, fuck it, dude. I'm leaving. I'm not sticking around this town. Going home. I'm going home because I'm not going outside of my, you know, 48 hour perimeter because I'm allowed right. to go that far. So I'm going to go home and be Joe. Like, I'm not going to be Lance Corporal, you know, Marine. Like, I'll never forget. I came home from Iraq. And I, I uh, was real into working out. And so I went to a uh, place, uh, a park in, in North Raleigh called Shelly Lake. And I went for a run um, because I was, you know, trying to keep my, you know, trying to maintain my physical standard while I was on leave. And I would go and I would run pretty much every day I was home. And I went on this run and I'm wearing like my, I had a, a battalion shirt, a green shirt that had my, my battalion logo and then a big logo on the back of it. Oh. And that's what I'm running in. And I'm running past a pulley function. Like the, how the path kind of takes me along this, this trail is a, around a pulley function. And this fucking Sergeant major calls me over and I'm like, I'm not shaved. So I've got like stubble and like, I haven't had a haircut and like, two and a half weeks because i was on like my post-deployment leave and he calls me over and he's just like man what the fuck are you doing i'm like dude bro i am home like let me just be me like let me be who the fuck i like i am not like yes i know the marine corps wants me to be a marine 24 hours a day seven days a week when i take off the uniform i'm done like i just leave that at the fucking it's like it's how i am now with work when i leave the office i leave all my shit at the office yeah like if there's work i have to do on a project or something fine i'll do it but like i leave that shit there like yeah there's and and that's what i hated about the marine corps is that you were expected no matter where you were when you were and that was the lifers like there were so many guys who were doing four years honorably and they just you know doing their thing like they didn't want to do 20 years and that's okay they're not shit bags for doing four years or eight years or however long but the guys who were doing those 12 16 20 year stents they viewed you as a fucking shit bag for like being like i'm done i've done what i wanted to do i'm going out like i'm gonna go do some other things in my life and they were like well you're a piece of shit for wanting that i I think it's important joe what you bring up about like when you're at work you're at work and when you're off you're off because absolutely even though like the the you need to have that balance you absolutely need to have a balance yeah um because even though the marine corps said Oh, you're a Marine 24-7. The Army said the same thing. You're a soldier 24-7. Like, it's understandable, but at the same time, when you sit down... So, (laughs) I think the best example I can give you is we went out to eat one night. It was a steakhouse. Our platoon sergeant was over there. We whispered to the waitress that it was his birthday, and he was with his family. It was funny as shit. He got the birthday song sang to him. Um. We fucking we joked around shit. with him. Uh, I mean, I would have I would have throat punched people. It it was I would have throat shit. punched it, people. It, it, he looked like he wanted to. I I wouldn't have wanted to. I would have done it. I remember when I came over from Iraq. My mom, we went. My so my mom's company had a 
a thing at RBC Center, which is where the Hurricanes the hockey team plays. Yeah. And um, she had a box there. Her company had a box, and it wasn't her, but her company did. And so we did this big thing where we all went, like, friends, like her, my mom's friends that I've known my whole life were there. And I remember, like, I was so pissed about this. I actually got a Facebook message from someone who was there. It was like, hey, bro, like, welcome home. I saw you on Jumbotron. You look fucking pissed. But <laughs> they, like, they put me up on the Jumbotron. They were like, welcome home, Lance. I was like, you son of a... Like, I remember you just... Son of a I, like, I got, like, the death stare over at, like, my... I was like, the fuck did you do this for? And she, and like everyone in the, and look, I get why civilians do it, but like people stood up and like clapped and shit. And I was like, yeah, I'm not that fucking special, bro. It's one of the reasons I don't have social media. I'm not special. You yeah. know, like I'm like, there are so many people who are better than me in the service Yeah, that deserve all of this. Not me. Like yeah. give that shit to them. I'm doing this for me. I'm not doing it for any of you fuckers. No, like, I don't give it. Like you could die in a car accident tomorrow, and I would, I would not give a shit. Yeah. Just like I would die tomorrow in Iraq, you would not care. Yeah. You're not going to shed a tear for me. I'm not going to shed a tear for you. Let's just <laughs> call it. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah. Like I'm not doing this for you, and don't be so narcissistic to think that I am. So, I I think when we started this session, and yesterday I talked to Casey about the transition from military life to civilian life. So Casey ran into some stumbling blocks because he had a plan that didn't work out exactly, you know, as he planned. And, and so my, my question to you, Joe, is really like getting out because you talked about how you didn't really have a tough time. So it's like, you know, basically it sounds like you had a job lined up. And so what was well, that? What so, was your plan so, when you were coming out? So getting out getting out for me was not as difficult for a lot of other people. And I think that is in part because I live so close to home and on the weekends I was able to kind of come home and be me. Mm. I didn't live it the full time all day long. And when I had to, I was just like, fuck you. I don't give a <laughs> shit. Prosecute me. I don't like whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I got out of Lance Cooley. Like I was, I was part of the Lance, Lance, Lance Cooley mafia, you know, um, my, you know, one of my favorite songs while I was in was the EAS song. And if you haven't listened to it, it came out while we were in Iraq. Is it, it's not the, the one by Ty Flannery, is it? I don't know who I can't I'm, remember the I'm guys. Name dropping because he, he does the. He was a he TV was a two fourteen mountains. No, 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 no. Okay, he was a marine. He was a marine that in, guy's cool in shit. California. I can't Tyler something. I think is his name. I dude, I can't remember. But seriously, I heard your song for the first time in Iraq. Wait, it's called the it? EAS song. It's called the EAS song. He, I, and I, I saw it, for the, it for to the, first the time. tune of, uh, no, he wrote it. Candy like, Mountains. no, no, it's not too, he re, like, he wrote it. I'm going to look it up. It's awesome. You said his name is Tyler, Tyler, something or another. Cause this guy's name on Facebook is Ty Flannery. It might be the same guy. I'm not sure if it's the same guy. That would be funny as no. shit. It is. The song is funny as shit. Yeah. No, this is great. Cause you're like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Um, but when I got out, so first of all, I didn't go in as young as most guys. I had some life experience before I went in. Like, I wasn't the guy who got out right at high school and went Ew. to boot camp. Like, I had kind of lived a life before boot camp. Um, the first thing I knew that I, so I knew kind of what I wanted to do, which was work in alcohol. Uh, I just, I was like, I love drinking. I want to find a job in drinking. Like I want to do something in that. And I brewed, I brewed a little bit. I started getting into brewing. I know that. Yeah. I started brewing when I got um, home from Afghanistan. Um, my wife got me a, uh, uh, like a home brew kit, like a, like just a $40, like just self starter kit. Mm. And I fucking loved it. Like I brewed, a, I yeah. brewed my first batch of beer, and I was like, "This is what I want to fucking do." Yeah, because this is awesome. Because I worked in kitchens um, 
before the Marines. Like that's all I had really done oh. was just work in kitchens for, and like be, you know, hand to mouth. And I loved working in kitchens. I loved being in that stressful environment and creating and doing all that shit. Um, so I was like, I can create with beer. Yeah. Just like I can with food. Yeah. So I just kind of popped it in my head. I was like, all right, so if I'm going to go to college, like when I was at, when I came home from Afghanistan, I was like, if I'm going to go to college, I want to combine my love of, of creating food with alcohol. So that means making beer. I'm going to find where the best city to go for brewing is. And at the time it was Denver, Colorado. Cause they had like, at the time they had like 250 breweries in the city. Wow. Just in the city. Okay. And, and Raleigh had absolutely nothing. And now Raleigh's yeah. craft beer scene is huge, but I was like, so that's where I'm going. So what yeah. can I do in school there? And so I, then I found college, a college I can go to where I can learn culinary and, uh, as an associates and I can get a bachelor's in like management and, and so, and then I can maybe get hooked up with a brewery yeah. and then kind of things changed while I was there. Um, I got, I, you know, breweries were so hard to become a part of. You really had to know somebody like you had to be good friends with them. You had to like, you really had to like know someone. So for a guy who's not from Denver, didn't really know anyone in the brew scene it was almost impossible to get a job in a brewery and i tried like i tried and so i would talk to my advisor uh and he was like well we don't have a a brewery that we're kind of uh, that our college and we, i went to a hospitality college i went to johnson and wales which is and apparently they're closing in denver so johnson and wales fuck you you should keep denver open <laughs> um, but they, they had a distillery that they had re a relationship with a very yeah. small distillery. And I was like, brewing, distilling at the time I was like, God, the same thing. Yeah. So I went and I interned, um, and, uh, interned at that, that distillery and it was great. And I was like, this is what I want to do. Distilling is fucking awesome. It's way better than brewing. Yeah. Like in my eyes, I was like brewing. You're like, you're creating a mash and then you're letting that mash ferment yeah um well and distilling is so much more complicated because you're like you're creating the mash and you're fermenting still but then you're running it through the still you're stripping it and then you're putting it into the right barrels if you're if it's an aged product and you're letting it age and it's it, it's it, it was really cool for me so um i did that and then i was like i really want to see in this world and i graduated from college and the distiller was like, dude, we, we can't afford to hire you on as an employee. You were an intern. You were free labor to us. You did operations. Um, you did sales. You did production. You did everything. Yeah. But we can't pay you. Yeah. Um, but our distributor that we work with and we partner with can. And they hired me on, and I went and learned warehousing and distribution through them and that's the company i think i talked about last week that i was like it's a great fucking company to work for yeah. and i wish i never had left um but i needed to come home and they don't exist in north carolina because of the liquor laws yeah. like if they if they existed in liquor laws if they existed in north carolina i probably would have taken a demotion like a a, a, a yeah. pay decrease yeah. to come home and be with family because they were such an awesome company um just to work for yeah. And so I, I ended up quitting with them to move home, to be closer to family. Yeah. And then COVID hit with a small company that I worked for here. That's a local company. Um, and I got laid off. Essentially. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Yeah. So it's, it's but nice. I, didn't so, have, I mean, I, it's, it's nice to know that you had a, a place where, I, but I didn't it's have a like, transition issue. Like I didn't like, yeah. I never had that. I, um, I feel weird about talking with military service to people. Yeah. Um, you know, being in the corporate world that I was in with the company, I always felt like I had to wear a mask because they expected a veteran to be kind of a certain <laughs> way. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't, it was that was kind of my own bias put onto it. It wasn't something that 
Uh, but I didn't have this whole this whole thing that I know a lot of veterans have and buddies that I have have really struggled with. No. I don't. I had never had that. Just because I was always able to keep my kind of my two lives separate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I just um there are parts of the Marine Corps that I really don't miss. Um <laughs> that I'm glad I'm like fucking thankful that like when I got out of the Marine all my Marine Corps shit is sitting in a box in my attic. Like I don't yeah. have really the only thing I have from the Marine Corps are, are, are pictures of two two of my buddies that were killed in action. Oh. Um and that's it. That's like the only resemblance in my house that you see of me being in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Like all my uniforms, like that promotion warrant I got, um, you know, everything else is like in this box up in the attic. Yeah. And that's just kind of how I look at it. Like that yeah. was a chapter in my life. That chapter is over. Time to move on. And just yeah. kind of, the, you know, being in the military taught me that I can deal with a lot of shit. I can be adaptable yeah. and just adapt to the situation. That's good. And when I got laid off, so I got laid off six, seven months ago. Yeah. And I was out of work for six or seven months. Yeah. But the Marine Corps taught me, you know, no plan survives first contact and always try and be as prepared as you can. I had a lot of savings. I just had a lot. Of, I had a lot of savings. So I was able to go and not have to worry about, oh, where's my next meal coming from? Or yeah. how am I going to keep the roof over my head? I was still able to pay my mortgage. I was still able to go grocery shopping. I was able to budget. I was able, because yeah. I had that. I was, yeah. I had always planned for the worst. And now that I got my new job, um, finally, thank God, because <laughs> I was going fucking crazy sitting in my house with COVID and everything. Um, I was able to kind of go out and, and start working again. Yeah. But that's good. I just I I never it's, had that. It's good. It's like it's like everything you learned from the core you were able to apply. It's like everything that that you experienced, you know, you you were able to put to good use. I'm sorry, I'm talking shit to my one of my best friends. Oh yeah. <laughs> he's a right he's he's uh He's a huge Ravens fan, and I'm a Steelers yeah. fan. You're a Steelers fan. I am a Steelers fan. I grew up a Steelers fan. Yeah. Okay. I was born at Wake Med right here in Raleigh. Really? Yeah. My, My dad is a Steelers fan, or at least was. I don't know if he still is. I don't know how to spell football. Oh, I love. I so I love sports. I love but, competition. I love sports. Um, and. There are sports that I love to watch. There are sports that I love that I think are great. Like, I love golf. Like, I love to play golf. Fucking hate watching that shit. I hate it. Like, I'll watch it and read a book. I just look at the scoreboard every so often. Or if there's a player that I'm really like, he's really good and want to be able to see how he swings. But for the most part, I just love to play golf. Like, I go out and play golf as much as I can. And that makes me sound old and extremely white. And okay. <laughs> uh, but I, I do. I mean, it's one of those things. Like, golf is one of those sports that you really have to focus on you getting better. Mm. That's what I like about it. Um, you're not playing a, in a team sense. Like, you're not making, like, it's all about you and trying to master who you are uh football basketball i love those sport baseball love baseball don't like watching baseball on tv baseball is one of those sports in my mind yeah. that you have to go and see live like watching it on tv does absolutely nothing I can pre agree with that up or and, not i've been to quite a few live baseball games i played L baseball yeah. live love I, baseball. I played baseball for nine years yeah, so baseball is a live chess game to me. It's a, yeah. it's a strategic like who is up at bat, who's pitching, what's going on, what's happening out in the field, and it's it's a strategic kind of mindset, and it's yeah. trying to get the best out of. It's a situational game, yeah, um, which is what I love because I love those those types of games. But watching it on TV, you just lose something. People are like, oh, baseball's fucking stupid. Like, I remember when I was in London, people were like, you like baseball? And I'm like, it's pretty much the same as your soccer or your football. 
Uh, we call it soccer. <laughs> yeah. It's really fucking slow, but you can see kind of the, the, the strategic thinking forming as the game is being played. Yeah. Like you can see, but it is fucking slow as shit. Yeah. Like it really is slow as shit. No. Yeah. Um, that's why like going to a live soccer game is way better than watching that shit on TV. No. Yeah. Same with baseball. Like baseball sucks on television. So, so how, Joe, how do you, like, because you said you were born and raised here, so why, how are you a Steelers fan, and how are you still a Steelers fan? So, uh, so yeah, uh, my dad is from Pennsylvania, he's from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. he, he was born in Pittsburgh, um, moved down here when he was very young. I was born in Lancaster. He was born in Oakdale. And, nice. and lived in Oakdale until he was like 13 or 14 and then moved down to a small town here in North Carolina. Okay. And then when, when, when I was born, like I came along many, many, many years later, many years, hmm. many, many years after he moved down here. Okay. Um, he just kind of grew up watching Steeler ball, uh, okay. you know, cause he was a young man going home to see his family back home so he was in his 20s in the 70s when you know you had the iron curtain or the steel curtain with uh, the mean joe green defense and terry bradshaw and all that um and he'd go home and watch him play at three river stadium and just had such a passion for football and he also is the one who taught me about baseball yeah. um those are his two big sports um that growing up here, we didn't have the Panthers. The Panthers weren't here when I was a kid. Yeah. They didn't come around until I was like, I think they came around like 96, 97. And by that time, I was like, I was already kind of, I was like, this, I don't give a shit about them. Yeah. Like, why the fuck do I care about, like, like <laughs> who cares? Like, I have my team. Like, I know my team. I was ingrained. Like, I came out of the womb with a terrible towel. So, I just, <laughs> I, like, like, I was, like, we, wa I can remember um, watching football on Sundays and watching the Steelers play. And I can remember my grandmother at the time. Because my, grand my grandfather died before I was born. Uh, the, the, my grandfather's from Pennsylvania. Or that side of the family is from Pennsylvania. And um, my grandmother, the one time she liked watching sports was when the, tele when the Steelers were on. Yeah. Because that reminded her of her husband who had passed. Yeah. Um, and I would always get told, this is the greatest football team in America. They won more. At the time, they had <clears throat> won more Super Bowls. And, you know, we are, we are a steel family. Because my, yeah. my granddad moved down here for a steel mill. To work into steel like he he moved down he was transferred from a steel company that had a, a mill down here and he came down to run it or whatever hmm. or manage it or something i don't know and so like we just you know pittsburgh was a steel town we were a steel family and that just kind of translated to us and so growing up i can remember being you know young young like five six seven years old and yeah the only team, the only football I cared about was the Steelers because that was the time that we all sat down and watched football. Yeah, that was the, like it was it. Like I didn't care about any other football other than just the Steelers. Yeah, and that's how I became a Steelers fan. So when the Panthers came, I was like, "Oh yay, go Panthers!" I was like, "The fuck cares about the Panthers?" <laughs> that and they had Julius Peppers on there. I'm a Duke fan. He went to UNC, so I automatically had to fucking hate those guys because I'm <laughs> a huge Duke fan. Um. Even though they suck at football, they really do. But basketball, fuck, they are amazing. Oh, so <laughs> that's how I—that's how I, I like. I was just curious. I'm totally down to talk about it. I just—that's how uh, I think. I'm not not a not a much gooder, gooder. sports fan. <laughs> Me know? no like sports. No, yeah. I love I love like sports. I'm I'm I, pretty sure. So so my dad does Steelers. Uh, I was born in Lancaster County Hospital in Pennsylvania. Uh, my dad was born and raised, I think, in Pennsylvania on a farm. He's he he played football in college. Mm. 
You I know, played football so, through middle school and high yeah, school. Yeah. Yeah. I played no, I, baseball. I, I can't even play football. Uh I I played baseball for nine years. Um then when we were down here while I was growing up, I remember turning the antenna on the roof to get the NASCAR races. I fucking hate NASCAR. Uh other I'm, than that. I'm I'm not a fan of NASCAR. I'm just like it's the left turn. All right, big big deal. Yeah. It yeah, you've got to stay awake for five hundred laps. Okay. Take a rip it and call me in the morning. Like you're turning left. Like I like the uh the European races. Like I'll watch those because those are interesting. Cause they do, you know, the indie races where they, they're doing like a nine mile long track or whatever. Yeah. But I'm not a car guy. I'm yeah. not big into cars. So I'm like, I don't care. Oh, I fucking love cars. Like I love going fast. I mean, you see the, the SVT in my driveway. The number one reason it doesn't start right now is because my Corolla battery exploded. Yeah. So, so I took the battery out of the SVT to put it over there. But my SVT is a Cobra. It's an 01. So it's before they were manufacturing Cobras with the supercharger. Okay? Yeah, you, you, you might as well be speaking Chinese to me because I have like i well, that's like, okay but i'm like, gonna speak I, chinese i don't give a shit as long as it's comfortable like the only car so the only car i really know about is one car and that's my dream car yeah and that's the 19 uh was a 1972 chevelle super sport yeah that's it that's all i care about it's an ss though yeah it's an ss super sport yeah yeah, yeah it's all i give a shit about yeah like every i don't know how it works do you i'm know, not gonna build one do you know though do you know how fast that car goes? Probably 100 miles an hour? 120? I don't know. Who fucking cares? Who fucking cares? All I know is that the chassis rocks when you rev it. That's all yep. I care about. That's it. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You just... Oh, man. And the whole chassis just sits there and rocks. That's all I give a shit about. Um, yeah, but I don't know how it works. Yeah. I don't know anything about... Like, I know how to, like, change my oil change the tires yeah but like if you Basics. put like yeah if you put like a frame in front of me and be like but you know build me a car you know like, the well, difference know. between a, a supercharger and a turbo right other than the name no not no. really like I, I really like i cannot i can't i don't know shit about cars like i yeah. really like i'm not like it just it was never something i grew let's, up with let's put it this way the the car that I have out there, the supercharger was not put in until a later year. So I put a turbo in it. So I took a fifteen thousand dollar car and I put fifteen thousand dollars into it to make it go faster. As a as a financial guy, here's what I know about cars: they depreciate real uh, the minute you drive them off the lot. As a financial guy, that's that's what I know. Who that that is exact, <laughs> that is all I know about cars. Yeah. I like, um, you know, I uh, like I know what I like. Like, so, so I know I don't like Ford so model Tal cars. Talladega Nights. Love Tal. I love the movie. I want to go don't, fast. Uh, yeah, if you ain't if you ain't first, you're last. I like to go fast. Like I don't mind like. Uh, but I don't need to know how it works. I just yeah. need to know what button or pedal to push to make me go fast. That's yeah. all I really fucking care about. Yeah. Like, that's it. Dude, I'll, I'll tell you what, like, nothing. I, I think it's just, I don't know what it is, but to sit in there to start it. I was to too ADD. It, I like, was too ADD to like, learn about cars. Like, cause with car, like I no, don't, don't get me wrong. Like I didn't grow up like this. Oh, I know no. about one car. No. That's the, the SVT in my driveway, the Cobra that I have sitting out there. I know how to start it. I know how to work on it. I, I know how to run it. I would have looked at, I would have looked at like, if you would have put me in like a car class, like a body shop class or whatever in yeah. school, I'd have looked at it just like a geometry class. 
Like I want, because I was the type of kid that wanted to be outside. I've always loved the outdoors. Yeah. Like I am an outdoor fanatic. I love to be outside. Anything I can do, and it's one of the reasons I love like golf and watching sports is because I get to go outside and participate and be in those things. But man, I fucking love to go into the woods. No. Like I don't need to do anything. I can just go for a walk in the woods. Yeah. I can go for a walk in the woods for like six hours and be just happy as shit. Like mm-hmm. just and one of the reasons I love the Marine Corps and wanted to join the Marine Corps because I knew that would get me out into the woods. Yeah. Um, like I love being out outside. Like I just I like when I'm inside, I always look like people like I know a bunch of people <laughs> that love video games and I'm like the fuck do you love video games for i like i play video games but like for five minutes at a time and then i turn them off and i'm like okay i'm I'm done with this it's a beautiful day i'm going outside like i just want to be and it's not to exercise or do anything like that it's just i like to be in the woods i love it like i just yeah i just love being in the woods yeah period yeah like i could go sit buy it i'm the same i'm the same with video games like i don't i don't get even own a fuck fucking console i own (laughs) one because like i'd like i'd like there's a the like some of the console some some of the games i'm like oh it's a first person shooter okay let me play this oh it's not real life i'm turning this off Mm. like all right let me let me go outside now yeah and i just i and i don't like to be outside in like cities yeah like i have to be in the woods yeah like one of my dreams, like if I had my way and I, money was not an issue, I would go and be like, um, uh, 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 like a Dick Pendecki, I think <laughs> is his name. You know who I'm talking yeah. about? No. Um, so he made a documentary. Uh, well, and it's not a documentary. It's he. So this is a guy who, like in the 50s or 60s, went to Alaska oh. and built his own house. No. Like he like cut down his own logs, yuled them. And like just build his like built a house out of that like he oh. no construction like he just he didn't buy land he just kind of found a spot that was really remote and was like this is it i think it was called twin lakes and it's now a museum up in alaska i'm like that's my fucking dream that's what i want to do yeah. like i just want to go into the middle of the woods build a house like on my own and just go out into the woods and just kind of fucking dick around walk hunt fish that's it it's all it's all i fucking care about yeah and i you know i don't like people like oh you like hunting you want to kill i'm like no like the reason i would hunt in that situation is for food yeah and that's it i'm not taking fucking pictures of that shit yeah like fuck those people i don't give it like you're a fucking idiot if that's what you're doing (laughs) like i don't i don't do it now yeah i want to live and grow and be like just be off in the middle of the woods yeah and just be away from society because people fucking suck well they do they really do i that's why i don't do social media just want to take this opportunity to thank you joe uh you don't have to be here you choose to be here yeah that's true i don't have to be here I appreciate that. Hey, I appreciate Brian. that because I think with our resources page and with the goal that I want to work to accomplish as a podcast, as a show, as a veteran is to help other veterans. I think you bring a lot of value to the table and I, I don't bring a lot. I, I, I don't think I do. I, uh, <laughs> I don't, I, uh, I'm just kind of like, yeah, yeah i'm here like i exist that's that's me yeah um no i mean for for a lot of vets you know i know guys who have struggled coming home and it makes me really kind of sad because i'm like i don't know why you're doing that and that's me like it's not that i'm better or whatever um i'm just like i wish you would have picked up the phone and called me like i you know I really like, yeah, we haven't, like, I haven't talked to a lot of, like, I haven't talked to anyone I've served with in six years. Yeah. Actually, that's not true. I talked to Tanner and like, I talked to Tanner probably last year. Yeah. But like the the bulk of the, like my really good friends that I had, I haven't talked to in a long time. 
I'm really sad about that. Like, I'm really. Well, I think it's. I think it's super important. I think what I'm doing, you know what, what my focus is here is to bring veterans together no. to to give them an outlet. So to me, it doesn't matter if it's someone who needs that outlet or someone who needs that connection. Mm. Uh, it's really just something people can relate to. And I mean, for you just showing up, mm. I, I'm grateful for that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm grateful that we have this, you know, that I have this opportunity to come in and talk, uh, you know, cause you know, I think one of the big things is, is being able to talk about your experiences, yeah. good, bad, and whatever. Like, it's just, it's important to be able like, I had a friend of mine, um, he wasn't, uh, well, okay. So <laughs> this was a friend of mine's significant other yeah. who had like some traumatic experiences in his life and she called me she's like can you like because you've seen war can you like kind of you know walk him through how you deal with it i'm like you yeah. fucking talk about it like that's what i do like yeah. that's like i get drunk and like i'll, I'll get drunk with I, and i don't do it with like people randomly yeah I do it with people like you that have served or people that I know that have kind of been with me through the military journey. I'm not like the type of dude, you know, I don't, it, there's a difference between talking about it and bragging about it. Like no. people who I hear that are like, Oh, I did this and I did that. And I got these medals and that medal. I'm like, those are the ones I typically call bullshit on. Yeah. Because I'm just kind of like, eh, did you? Um, most of the guys I know, when they talk about it, it's not a, a bragging thing. Yeah. It's just kind of like, here it is. Here's what I did. Here's what I saw. Here's what I participated in. Yeah. Um, and that tends to help them a lot. Like, I know guys who have, you know, tried to commit suicide. Um, or committed or succeeded in committing suicide. Um, and you know, they just I'm like, why? Like, why yeah. did you do that? Like, I get like one of the guys I know who tried to commit suicide and failed, I know why he did it. He was severely wounded in yeah. Afghanistan, severely wounded. Yeah. Um, and I think if any one of us would have been in his shoes, we probably would have gone the same route. Um, but he's got such now an outlook years after this has happened. This was years ago. It wasn't like, um, you know, cause when he got wounded, he's like, my life's over. He's, he's an yeah. amputee. That's what I'll say. I don't want to like tell his story. Yeah. Um, but he was an amputee and, um, he was like, fuck me and my life's over. Yeah. And, um, he had some ups and downs after getting medically separated. And he tried to kill himself um, a while ago. Uh, it was. It's been a while. Yeah. And um, he was like, "That was a really low point in my life." Yeah. But now that I can kind of talk about the things that you know, I can find people through podcasts and social media and you know whatever else you know, just going to group meetings. Yeah. Um, you know, he's I think he's doing a lot better. And I haven't talked to him in shit, dude. I think the last time I talked to him was eight years ago. I lost a lot of, you know, and that's that's what's really upsetting. I lost a lot of contact oh. with with people. I tried to stay in contact with some people. And my wife actually is more in more contact with people <laughs> I served with than I am. Of course. Because she has Facebook and she'll like, she'll just yeah. shoot him an email and yep. be like, hey, how you doing? Hey, what's up? And be like, hey, this th guy says this I or that guy says uh, that. And I'm like, I think that's good though. Like, uh, so Richard Kaufman, he's one of the guys uh, listed as a comeback coach on the resources page of this show. Um, if you go there, if you click on the link, if you look at it, you see how 
after his service, even during his service, he broke down. He broke down. His life broke down. He wasn't seeing what he wanted. And so he made certain changes. He made, uh, you know, certain goals. And so he was able to recover that. And so, like, I mean, you see my arm. Yeah. The, these people... You know, what's unfortunate is some of them are no longer here because of things outside of our control. Like, they got blown up. They were in Afghanistan. Right. Um, that's the bracelet that I have. It, it was... Uh, I never... So, I always wanted... I, I know a lot of guys have yeah. those bracelets. Um, and I wanted one. And I never yeah. got one. Like, I didn't yeah. know where to go. No one ever so, was like, this is where so you really go to get they bracelets. Just make them, but this one is Sergeant First Class Cribben. So it's Stephen Cribben. Um, so he was my uh, provost sergeant in Germany. What I loved about that this guy is he made, he took basically a UXO, which was like a 155 round. Mm -hmm. And turned it into the f-bomb that was creative as fuck mm -hmm. <laughs> but then he went off and he went through special forces training he was a staff sergeant when i knew him yeah and once he joined special forces he went through selections he went through the q course and he got deployed he died because he got uh you know, yeah. uh, an ID or whatever the fuck. Um, so I actually got this from my my op sergeant that was here getting back surgery done at Duke. You know, um, so it it really just depends on the situation. Uh, one of the guys I talked about earlier doing the the gallon challenge yeah. with the milk, he's on my arm. Uh, it's kind of sad because. Yeah, I've got a. I've, well, I have a memorial tat. Like, I've got yeah. a tattoo um, for two of my buddies who were killed yeah. um, over in, in Afghanistan. Um, and they were both. I look; those two dudes were both better, not only better men than I was, but better Marines. Like, I was like, yeah. when, um, when the first one died, so they died nine nine days apart. Yeah. One died in a firefight. The other one died um, by stepping on an IED. And um, I remember, because I was in the firefight that um, the first one died in. And I wasn't next to him. I wasn't, like, right there. Like, we were, like, three, four, five hundred yards apart. And I remember hearing it go out over the radio and just kind of being like, well, you know, just kind of being like, you know, this is what happens in war. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, um, and then I remember nine days later being on patrol and hearing an explosion, like really like off in the distance. Um, and then it was my roommate who was killed. And I was like, Jesus, like him, like yeah. oh, fuck, like this is like, and that was two months into our deployment. I was like, this is going to be a real fucking deployment. That's that, <laughs> that's what it's going to be. And um, I was just kind of like, "Shit, dude!" Like the, the yeah, like I, um, when when my roommate was killed, that's when I kind of really changed. Yeah. In in Afghanistan, I was like, "Oh, uh, like when when the first guy was killed, I was like, it's what's happened, you know, it's random as shit." When the second guy died, I was like, oh, okay, like, life has changed. Um, but I know so many guys that it affected those events, affected them way differ differently yeah. than, than me. Um, mainly some of them because they, they were there and they witnessed it. I didn't w witness any one of those. Like, I wasn't no. right next, next to either one of those guys, but. You know, you've got to talk about this shit. You really got to kind of go through and and dive down and and talk about it. Um, I think that's what helps people the most. Like guys who try and bottle it up, um, try and bottle their that. You know, I know in in the Marines you don't 
well, it's not an emotional thing. Because in the Marines, you're like, oh, you're talking about this shit. You're a fucking pussy. No. Um, but that's that's not what it is. Just guys who kind of come home and are like, this is what happened. No. This is where my mindset was when it happened. And I'm trying to deal with that. No. They tend to have, I think, a lot more success coming home than guys who are like, fuck it i don't want to talk about it you don't you don't get it you'll never get it you know because they have this anger yeah they have this real kind of like the it and it festers yeah. like simmers within them they just because i get it like i wanted to be more of a a part of trying to help or save or whatever like trying to replay events that led to to those things and i was like i'm not gonna I mean, in my mind, I was like, I'm not going to belittle them yeah. and their their deaths to say that I was the one that affected it. That did. That's just not how it is. Yeah. Um. So you know, I would be like, okay, this is what I'm going to talk about, and this yeah. is how I'm going to talk about it. With and, you know, I won't share it on podcast or live or any. Yeah. You know, I just you know, too much respect for that, and I was just kind of like, man. I was like, this is how I'll deal with it. Like, yeah. you know, my wife knows there are a handful of people that have served um, that I talk to that I'm like, that are, we're in, you know, either the Marines or the Army yeah. that have lived through kind of similar experiences. And they're the people I talk to. Yeah. You don't, I think talking to psychologists is bullshit because yeah. they're just going to try and analyze you. Whereas people who've been there are kind of like, I get it, bro. Like, here's yeah. my situation. Here's my story. Not to brag. Like, it's not a bragging thing. It's just like, I get what you're going through. Like, yeah. I, I understand it. And then you kind of work it out. And, you know, I think, I think that's what you need. You need more of that. Yeah. This is the Veteran Talk Show. If you or someone you love is suffering as a victim of sexual harassment, sexual assault, needs help with addiction and recovery, or mental health and well-being, then please go to VeteranTalkShow.com slash resources. This show is hosted, produced, and edited by Ryan Smeltz. Our co-host is Joe Ballack and a guest starring veterans.